Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Where every day is casual Friday. That means Monday is casual Monday. Tuesday, casual Tuesday. Wednesday, casual hump day. Thursday, casual Thurs. That's what we call it. And Friday, casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, October 16th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps and steps and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Trump and Biden dueling town halls, maintaining the narrative of Donald Trump being a lunatic and Joe Biden not being a lunatic. U.S. tops 60,000 daily coronavirus infections. 44 states see infections on the rise. The Coney Barrett hearings end, and they end with calls for Dianne Feinstein to resign as the Democratic leader of the Judiciary Committee. Also on the program today, other Dems vow... What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. White House has been warned that the Julie, that Rudy Giuliani was the target of foreign misinformation scam. Meanwhile, Rudy's daughter has been saying the whole time, don't listen to my dad. Chris Christie is out of the ICA, ICU. He says, mea culpa when it comes to masks. And as the economy slowly sinks, more data shows the CARES Act payments end have left Americans in desperate times. Donald Trump rejects California's request for wildfire aid. Kamala Harris cancels weekend campaign travel. It's two cases of coronavirus pop up amongst her remote staff. White House seeks to block public transportation grants to anarchist jurisdictions all that and more oh including ben dixon and david rees and his co-hosts from the election profit makers podcast all this and more on today's majority report uh thank you for joining us ladies and gentlemen it is casual friday For those of you who are watching, you can see I am wearing a soft collar shirt, as is a tradition around here. Um, Casual Fridays. I don't uh, I don't maintain the the normal decorum that I do over the course of the week, although I have uh, shaved to um, to round out the week. We are now 18 days away from. You know, it's funny for. I've been doing this now professionally for uh, 15 years, 16 years. In fact, uh, the 10 year anniversary of this program will fall on election day of this iteration of the program. And um, in that time, there has been four presidential elections, 2004, 2008, 12, 16, and now 20. And, you know, we hear this all the time. This election is the most consequential of our times. I, I feel like I'm hearing it less these days because everybody believes it. <laughs> um, and uh, it is. It's going to be hugely consequential. Its outcome, from my perspective, will either be um, unimaginably, unimaginably dire for the country or vastly uh totally uh uh, i should say vastly necessary and totally insufficient and uh so you know part of what we're going to talk about is what we're starting to hear a little bit is the pushes that are coming 
from the left for Joe Biden, and not just from the left, I mean, imagine from a lot of different forces, actually, there's going to be a huge competition for Joe Biden's time and uh, efforts and disposition following, well, it's already started. And uh, we had uh, Bernie Sanders the other day was saying it's, he believes the progressives should hold their fire for the next two weeks and then uh, aggressively begin to lobby the Biden transition campaign uh, or apparatus and, and whatnot. And in fact, that, that, that lobbying is already going on. And um, I think it's scaring some people, to be honest with you. We will talk more about that in a bit. Uh, but let's wrap up what we were talking about um, for most of this week, which was the Amy Coney Barrett hearings. Next week on the program, we will have uh, the executive director of Demand Justice, Brian Fallon, on, in part because he is one of those organizations that have been calling for the resignation of Dianne Feinstein. And what we are seeing shape up in the Senate, or I should say the resignation, excuse me, the resignation from her position as the Democratic leader in the Judiciary Committee. Um, I, I would personally call for her total resignation, but I think that's probably a bridge too far. And uh, here's why. There was basically two visions of how the Democrats should perceive and deal with Republicans in the event that Joe Biden wins the election and that the Democrats take the Senate. Exhibit A is Sheldon Whitehouse basically telling the Republicans that this committee process, this nomination has been a sham. And like I said, what is sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Here's Sheldon Whitehouse in his um, in the a closing day of the Amy Coney Barrett hearings. Republican members on this committee, of whom I am very fond. But don't think that when you have established the rule of because we can, that should the shoe be on the other foot, you will have any credibility to come to us and say, yeah, I know you can do that, but you shouldn't because of X, Y, or Z. Your credibility to make that argument at any time in the future will die in this room and on that Senate floor if you continue to proceed in this way. I hope that that is not the case, but please don't think that there are two separate rules, that when there is Republican majority, the rule is because we can, and when there is a Democrat majority, the rule is, oh, no, you can't do it that way. With so there is Sheldon Whitehouse's vision, which is basically, look, that we are playing by a different set of rules now. You have established them, and we are going to play by those rules. And that is a, a, a vision that is in competition with one, if not explicitly expressed by Dianne Feinstein, implicitly. I want you to look at this clip. I understand there's also, understand what was going on in this hearing. The hearing itself was a sham. The idea that it was rushed in this way, particularly based upon the rules that established an empty seat in 2016 by Mitch McConnell, this was a sham process. In addition to that, you had multiple members of that committee who refused to either get a test or to publicly announce what their test results were when you had other members of that committee who had been infected by a disease that is running rampant in our country right now. Third is the political implications of number two and number one, and the fact that the chair of this committee, Lindsey Graham, is in the most competitive race of his Senate career. 
against a Democrat who has raised an extraordinary amount of money, who has done an incredible amount of work. Jamie Harris, not necessarily uh, going to be my favorite Democrat if he becomes the senator. But nevertheless, from there, it's just like strictly from a partisan standpoint. Remember these three things. When you hear Dianne Feinstein now, flush all of them down the toilet, all of those political narratives, perhaps costing the Democrats control of the Senate in four months. Listen to this. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank you. Uh, This has been one of the best set of hearings that I've participated in. And I want to thank you for your fairness and the opportunity of going back and forth. It leaves one with a lot of hopes, a lot of questions, and even some ideas of perhaps some good bipartisan legislation we can put together to make this great country even better. So thank you so much for your leadership. I would bet you everything I own that if that has not already been cut into an ad for Lindsey Graham, who is trying to to sort of split the difference between being a suck up to Donald Trump all this time and still appealing to Republican so-called moderates or suburban voters. If that's not been cut up as an ad already, I guarantee you it will be. It is astonishing astonishing that she would do that particularly that entire hearing was a sham it should not have happened she has already announced that if she is chair of the judiciary committee that she will honor blue slips which is exactly what patrick Leahy did which is exactly why donald trump will see 215 or 220 federal judges to lifetime appointments because the republicans held up dozens upon dozens of judicial nominees because of the use of those blue slips, which is just a favor you do to the opposing party. Mitch McConnell did not extend that same favor over the past four years, but Diane Feinstein wants to get in and reimpose that. This is universal. It's beyond surrender. I don't care what your politics are. If you're a member of the Democratic Party or you feel it necessary to vote for Democrats this time around so that Donald Trump does not retain power and so that Republicans do not retain power, Dianne Feinstein has fundamentally undercut your efforts. It is astonishing. And this is not a senator from West Virginia. This is not a senator who somehow snuck in from North Dakota. This is a senator from the bluest state in the entire country, from a state where the Republican Party does not exist, whose competition in the general election last time was a Democrat. It's it's insanity. It's insanity. And it is incumbent upon Chuck Schumer, who is ostensibly the leader of the Democrats in the Senate, to deal with this. Because if Dianne Feinstein is the chair of the Judiciary Committee going into a Biden administration, it's almost no different as if Lindsey Graham re- re- remains so. I mean, it's really, it's really stunning because she will leave open the door for the next Republican president to fill s- tens upon tens of seats. It really is. I, I That was... I have, I have, I do not hold uh, Diane Feinstein in terribly high regard, and I was still shocked by that. It was shocking how bad it was, but people were specifically worried about Feinstein going into this too. Yep, yep. Well, she blew the first Amy Coney Barrett hearing. She blew it, and completely handcuffed the the Democrats for this one. The only option they had was to not go in there, and I am convinced that she wanted to be able to do what she did. And that's why they went in there. It's just unbelievable. Meanwhile, uh, just a reminder, it's your support that makes this show possible. And uh, by becoming a, a member of the, the program, you support the, uh, the free show, and then you get the bonus uh, content every day. And don't forget, the Noma Key show is on at 3 p.m. today. Her guests, 
Brianna Westbrook, Kate Albright, Hannah, Jamie Augustine. You can check that show out at 3 p.m. on YouTube. And uh, today's program is sponsored by one of my favorite sponsors, Sunset Lake CBD. Right now, Sunset Lake CBD is harvesting their 2020 crop. Everything is hand uh, harvested. Everything is hand processed by a team of trained harvest specialists. And I will say this, I'm really proud about this. I mentioned the other day, I got a really nice letter from them. With the help of Majority Report listeners who have been loving Sunset Lake's CBD's like wide range of products. The team has grown from less than 10 people in 2019 to more than 20 people in 2020. They have a $15 minimum uh, wage. They are fair paying agricultural and manufacturing jobs in rural Vermont. And also uh, one of the things they do is they work with the university of Vermont on regenerative farming practices. And I was asking like, you know, tell, tell us more what that means. Well, it means reducing and eliminating harmful pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. They reduce or eliminate the use of outside chemical fertilizers. They're cutting down on water usage. They also are reducing and eliminating um, heavy tilling, which apparently, you know, where you till the, the ground, where you dig it up and this and that, which also sort of diminishes the, uh, all the minerals and nutrients in the soil. They're doing uh, cover cropping and seasonal crop rotation. They, they, they switch which uh, piece of land they're going to be uh, growing on in 2021, allow the land to sort of regenerate over the course of two or three years. When you grow a monocrop on one uh, a piece of land for too many seasons, everybody knows it, it begins to permanently disable, essentially, the soil. And we can't have that uh, because good dirt, good soil is hugely important uh, for our environment. And their product is amazing. And Matt, you're going to be excited about this. They're going to be unveiling new strains in mid-November for their smokables, including hand trim flower smalls, Matt, and keef. Some strains to anticipate are Spec 7, Sour Special Sauce, and Super Sour Space Candy. I don't know what any of that means, but uh, everybody who tries the smokables that I personally know have been loving them. Uh, for me, I'm a big tincture guy. They've got multiple uh, doses of tincture, which helped me sleep. The salve has been great for me on, uh, on my eczema. I don't know if it would work for you on that, but I know that people have said that it's helped with their aches and pains. It's got Arnica in it and beeswax, and there are gummies, uh, and they have a CBD infused coffee. And if you head over to sunsetlakecbd.com and use the coupon code left is best. One word, left is best. They'll give you 20% off. Check it out, folks. They're a great company, a uh, great product. It's turned me uh, from a, a skeptic into somebody who uses the product regularly, I got to tell you. So um, check it out. Meanwhile, um, joining us now, we have uh, Ben. Yes, we have uh, uh, we have the oh. proprietor of the Benjamin Dixon program. Ben there Dixon is here with us. Uh, ben, welcome to the show. Sam, thanks for having me, man. Appreciate you always. Um, so, all right, there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about. I set up the show um, earlier with uh, the um, with clips of the end of the Amy Coney Barrett hearing. And um, I want to get into the town halls last night and, you know, talk about how that maybe have changed a little bit of the narrative, but I don't think it did really, to be honest with you. But there are a couple of things that changed um, in terms of where Joe Biden sits. But I want to I want to look a little past the election at first, right, to a struggle that I think we're going to see. I and mean, there was a piece in Politico today by Alex Thompson, AOC House progressives warn Biden on corporate hires. Now, this to me sounds like we, whenever you read something in Politico, right? There's always like, you're seeing the shadow of something, it seems to me. Stories like this, I should say, hmm. right? Which is somebody wants a narrative out there right now right. that they think is going to help their cause. And the nature of this story is um, that is a little bit of like, People are worried that the left may be getting out ahead of their skis on this. 
et cetera, et cetera. It, it, it reads a little bit like there's an argument that maybe the left should trim their sails in pushing Biden. Now, of course, the reality is everyone's pushing Biden. Everybody's trying to get a seat at the table and uh, everybody's trying to get their personnel in to define what Joe Biden does as president, if that happens. And there's two different dispositions towards a lot of this in terms of the Republicans, broadly speaking, which I think was evidence between those two clips I just played, one between White House and Fine, uh, Fine, uh, Dianne Feinstein. Um, give me your sense of how this is shaking out to the extent that we can see it, right? Because a lot of this is, is sort of obscured from, from public view right now and obviously is, is secondary to the actual election. But these are the things... You know, people remember what happened with Obama in 2008. Yes. Yeah. No, I remember that. That's the, the thing I remember the most was one of his first hires was who was Timothy Geithner over at Treasury. And that's when I knew the jig was up. Right. All the hope and change kind of died inside of me at that moment. Um, but we have the full expectation. I think the left, we have the full expectation that this is the direction that uh, a Biden administration is going to go. And I agree with you. This is secondary to November 3rd. Right. We're, we're, we'd rather write. We would rather fight neoliberalism than neo-fascism. So, but we do understand what we're getting. I, I like the way that you put it. Like this is perhaps in the political piece, they're trying to um, tell us to get in line already. But the thing is, we're coming with a totally different attitude. I can't speak on behalf of AOC or anybody else on the left, um, obviously, uh, but I think there's a general sentiment on the left is that we're gonna do you guys a solid. We're gonna do America a solid. We're gonna help you get rid of the fascists that your policies, quite frankly, help bring into power. Uh, but once we've done that, please understand that you're next. We're coming for you. You can give us a seat at the table if you like, that's fine, but we're coming to take the table in the long run. Um, but we do realize that right now, all hands on deck to get rid of Donald Trump. Um, and, uh, I think that, I mean, I think that, that captures it quite a bit. And you, you mentioned Geithner and, uh, it was, I think like after the fact that we realized that one of his key transition figures was this guy Froman who ended up being his top trade negotiator mm. and, uh, was the one who was developing the PPP. And I don't know, it's, it's, see, it feels like a million years ago, <laughs> but, yeah. um, and, and PPP was, um, you know, of the myriad of reasons why um, why Hillary Clinton lost, Barack Obama pushing the PPP so heavily towards the end of his uh, administration was certainly something that cost Hillary Clinton in some ways. I mean, you know, we, we know there was a huge cauldron of reasons. TPP. Um, and it's hard to disaggregate. But Froman Thank had you. a yeah, list. TPP. And Froman, yeah. I should say, was a former Citibank executive. He was a Robert, uh, Robert Rubin acolyte and had a list that was generated presumably amongst his, you know, th that group of people um, as to who Barack Obama should be putting right. into positions. And, you know, I, I don't, I can't remember when the reporting came out on that list. It was years uh, later. Uh, and it was almost a one-to-one -one relationship between that list generated out of Citibank and who was going to, uh, fill a lot of the major uh, cabinet positions in, and, and sub cabinet positions, I should say, in the Obama administration. So this is a really, this is a very, this is what's so weird about this, Ben. This is a hugely important time. Like right, right now, in the run up to the election, of course, first order issue is get rid of Donald Trump. But the thing is that there is, there is, there is a whole host of people who are working on the second order issue right. and who have the luxury literally or the resources to do that. And everything that's happening literally right now in terms of the, uh, the Biden transition team. And that's going to happen starting November 4th. Mm -hmm. I mean, knock on wood or November 8th, knock on wood or November 10th or, you know, God help us, January December. 19th. I mean, <laughs> yeah. there, there is a, a transition that is going on that is going to define what happens in the first two years of the Biden presidency. And we know from experience with Obama that that is the one where you're going to see the most change. We know we, we saw it with Trump too. That's when the, uh, the, the major tax cuts passed to yes. the extent that there is 
going to be any major signature legislation that is passed. It's going to happen during that era, that first right. couple of years. And these are the people who are going to uh, sit in there and, and we have no access to it. I mean, it's sort of very frustrating in some way. We don't have the ability to push that right now. Right. Right. You know, I, I, one thing I want to point out though, Sam is, is I, I agree with, with what you're saying. Um, but I think it's important that we start looking this at this in terms of, of holistic cycles. Um, we, we weren't, we were caught off guard by uh, Obama's administration those first two years. Matter of fact, the first two weeks, um, we we probably we had more expectations of his administration than we uh, probably should have. But no, let me correct that. We were right to have those expectations, but the position that we were in, we didn't have the institutional power that we have now. We don't have as much as we need the left progressives, but we sure as hell have a whole lot more than we had in two thousand and eight. And so I think we're in a, in a, in a kind of semi-power position. We're not, we're not able to call the shots, but it would be folly for them to keep the more progressive wing of the party at bay in favor of, uh, let's say, uh, the Lincoln Project style Republicans who are going to need to find a new home. It would be extremely foolhardy for them to do that because it's not as though we're going to be left out in the cold. It's not as though them isolating us from this process and from those positions and from that influence silences us. Oh, no, it just gives us more ammunition to bring them hell. And I'm quite frankly, really excited about that because I've been quiet for the last five months or however long this journey has been. And I've got a lot to say. And so do so many other people. They should negotiate with us because they should want to bring us in versus have us on the outs. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I watched what happened in that Senate uh, hearing at the end of uh, yesterday. This is at the end of the Amy Coney Barrett uh, hearing. And um, there was a lot of soliloquy, uh, soliloquies, excuse me, by uh, the senators. And there was, and then we had this thing with Ben Sass yesterday yeah. where he leaks out. I mean, you, you know, this was not, this was not by accident that we know this where Ben Sass is trying to distance himself there is a feeling that I got when I watched that stuff. That sort of like sickly feeling that I had from years ago that you have elements of the Democratic Party who are already trying to build coalitions with Republicans across the table. And the Republicans mm-hmm. are doing it because they need to reform themselves after what they have done over the past four, really, I mean, May, more years, but certainly this past four years have been reprehensible and they need to reform themselves. And you see the Democrats not just giving them a life, um, you know, a life preserver, but mm-hmm. also building coalitions as a way of blocking and and needing the progressive wing less. Right. I mean, because mm-hmm. this is just this is about addition in many respects. And, you know, I'm looking at this political story and the difference. You're right. I mean, there's two differences, it seems to me, between 2020 and 2008. And that is uh, in 2008, we didn't have an AOC. We also we didn't have something like Justice Democrats who were challenging uh, right. primary challenges. We didn't have you know, what happened in 2018, where you knocked off a couple of, and by AOC, I mean, not just what she's saying, but what she represents in terms of a challenge to the democratic leadership. And like you say, we didn't have the skepticism of Obama. That is naive. I mean, it is, it couldn't be more the opposite at this point. (laughs) Right. I mean, it's like everyone is, is voting for Joe Biden with their eyes wide open with the lowest of expectations (laughs) And yeah. with the highest expectations that we need to engage. And remember, Obama, the Obama campaign had completely neutered all the outside groups to the extent that they existed. Uh, with that, they basically told all their donors, you don't give to these outside groups. Right. You give to us and we right. handle it. And, right. and so this is a very different time. And I, I think oh, yeah. just even like pointing out this stuff creates a certain pressure on, 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 on Biden at all. Yeah. No, I, it, this is, I, I did two totally different episodes this week. Uh, one episode, I was kind of disillusioned and I'm like, we're going to have to play an even longer game. We may be on the outs talking about uh, progress in general, the Democratic Party in general, in context of Amy Coney Barrett, like maybe we should be projecting 30 or 40 years out. But then the, the next day it came to me in a conversation I was having with Jonathan Smucker, um, um, who's an activist, that, that we really have, we're on the ascendancy here. 
Like we can't take it for granted. We can't belittle this or, 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 or look down on the fact that, yeah, we lost two primaries back to back, but they had to throw themselves on the sword, on their swords, the neoliberal wing. They had to throw themselves on their swords in order to stop us in 2020. And so uh, as, as bleak as this looks, um, there, are, there are people in positions of power with fundraising capacity, with larger fundraising capacity than some of the top Democrats in this country, yep. uh, with larger email lists than the top Democrats in this country, with larger media platforms than all the Democrats in this country, that we're just simply waiting for them to act stupid because we really have it out for them. Uh, in a way that they can't imagine we would rather work with them. No, that's not even true. Some of us are waiting to fight them. So they, it would behoove them to catch us on the ascendancy and make some changes if they want moderate changes, because we're coming for a progressive change, whether they like it or not. Let's play this clip from, uh, you know, like I say, the, the, the two town halls last night, the dueling town halls, and, and apparently more people watch the uh, Joe Biden town hall yep. than Donald Trump, which I think really must hurt <laughs> Donald Trump's feelings. <laughs> Donald Trump. yeah. um, but look, we went into this last night with the narrative of Donald Trump is a raving lunatic and Joe Biden is not Donald Trump. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's basically that's the proposition <laughs> from the Biden campaign in many respects. Yeah. Um, and 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 I think the if you look at the coverage and you look at what happened in these town halls, that's basically what everybody came out of it with. Uh, but this I found interesting. Here is Joe Biden. We don't, I'm not going to play the whole clip. We'll play part of it. He's asked about the, the, the 94 crime bill. And we are three weeks out from an election. And, you know, this is not the primary. Right. Joe Biden understands at the very least, and I don't know how, um, you know, it's, it's just words, but when a politician says certain things, that means they're trying to protect their flank. And if they feel a certain weakness in some area, that means that there's probably a weakness there. And so that's where you push. And here's Joe Biden uh, talking about that 94 crime bill. And my, this is, my feeling is the first time we've heard anything like this from him. Meantime, an awful lot of people were jailed for minor drug crimes after the exactly time. right. Was it a mistake to support it? Yes, it was. But here's the here's where the mistake came. The mistake came in terms of what the states did locally. What we did federally, we said it was, and you remember, George, it was all about the same time for the same crime. What I had done as chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I did, took the 10 circuit courts of appeals, took some really brilliant lawyers working for me in judiciary. We did a study and we determined what happens if for the first, second, third offense for any crime in the, in the criminal justice system, in, in, in the, uh, uh, at the federal level, if you're a black man, it's the first time you committed robbery. What, how long would you go to jail on average if you're a white man? How long? Black man would go to jail on average 13 years. White man, two years. I go down the list of every single crime. So we set up a sentencing commission. We didn't set the time. Every single solitary maximum was reduced in there. But what happened was it became the same time for the same crime. So it said you have to serve between one and three years. And they ended up becoming man much lower. Black folks went to jail a lot less than they would have before. But it was, it was a mistake. Let me ask another follow -up. Now, I don't think he did a great job necessarily of explaining that. But mm -hmm. he's at least trying to. But more importantly, he disavowed the 94 crime bill. And yeah. um, that's an interesting thing. I mean, I can imagine a Joe Biden going, it, it wasn't a mistake. It was other people's fault. But he said yeah. it was a mistake. And yeah. I think that like that, that and, and, you know, a quarter or I don't know, 50 cents will get you a phone call these days. But um, it's still better than if he had answered in a different way. Yeah. Um, I have mixed feelings about the 94 crime bill debate. Um, I'm very clear on the 94 crime bill. Um, of course, it was something that I happily weaponized during the primaries um, because he needed to answer for it. But at the same time, I think it's, 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 it's a weapon now being wielded by people who would happily and giddily do even more damage to the black community and to minority communities. So the disingenuousness of it, um, to me, uh, it reeks. And, and the fact that Joe Biden waited this long 
to disavow it in the same in the way that he did, you know, that's just bad politics, right? That's not only like bad judgment, but that's really bad politics. So I'm glad he's finally come around to it. But by the time he came around to it, like I've moved on past it, right? And I think more people need to move on past it because at this point it's in the hands. It, when, it's a, when it's a debate between the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, who openly spoke out against those aspects in 94 uh, against Joe Biden, that's one thing because we have Bernie Sanders on the record being against the very things that came into fruition. When it's a debate between Joe Biden and the Republican Party, I'm not even concerned about the 94 crime bill anymore because I know if Republicans have their way, they will double down on it in 2020. Right. That's a good point. Um, I found it interesting that he he did that. And I wonder, you know, at this juncture, um, I wonder what, you know, maybe it's a, just a genuine uh, uh, feeling uh, on some level, or maybe there's some indication that like um, he needs to give this to the left. I mean, I, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, yeah. And, well, I mean. Go ahead. To, to, to that to that point, you're right. Like that's that's the political side. The, the politics side of it is, yeah, man, you should have been on top of this a long time ago. Like you you saw this coming in the primaries, and it represents a level of stubbornness that that is uh, kind of present in most in most politicians. Um, it, it is almost though he's trying to stop the hemorrhaging, and I think he can. But in terms of like the the sincerity of either side of, of the equation at this point, I mean, it's all political theater, and um, and I don't know how much it's going to move the dial one way or the other because I think even the black community and anyone who was affected or moved by the 94 crime bill, I think that's already baked in as well. Yeah. I think one of the things that, that his answer provides is just more, I guess, uh, fodder for the idea that Joe Biden is a normal politician. <laughs> he is going to actually look at the issues and have some set of reasoning for things. Right. And I think you know, that's been the Biden strategy throughout this is like, we're not going to make any waves. We're just going to try and convince people that you can go back to some form of normalcy when you turn on your TV or your radio. The top story isn't that, uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump has uh, lit the world on fire or something. <laughs> Here is uh, Joe Biden, however, talking about climate change. And this is really stunning. When you think this week, like, we just saw Amy Coney Barrett say like, I don't have any right. thoughts on, on the reality of climate change. Like, <laughs> seriously? Seriously. Um, but here is uh, Joe Biden highlighting uh, one aspect of that is problematic in regarding uh, climate change. And make a lot of money doing it. For example, right now down in, in and uh, people, when I say that, they wonder what I'm talking about. The biggest carbon sink in the world is the Amazon. More carbon absorbed from the air diminishing global warming in the Amazon than all the carbon emitted on a yearly basis from the United States of America, from all vehicles and all means. So we have to use our imaginations. We have to move in the direction as well, providing for electric vehicles. Electric vehicles will save billions of gallons of oil, create estimated, not me, Wall Street, one million automobile jobs. But what's but we're lagging me. We're not investing. We're not doing any of the research. Got to take another quick break. We'll be I mean, so there it is, you know, and again, like he's uh, I, I wouldn't say this is the most, you know, cohesive response to a global uh, uh, warming. I mean, he's sort of dancing around a little bit, but he's he's at least bringing up like concepts that are relevant uh, to the right. to the issue. He's obviously he's, you know, acknowledging its existence. It's interesting. There was a store, uh, a, a study that came out the other day that said if we were to be able to return like one third of the world's farmland to the wild, essentially uh, create forests from it, that we would go a long way uh, yeah. to dealing with climate change just by by creating more carbon sink, essentially, uh, you know, place basically the functional equivalent of like a a dump for carbon. I don't know how right. else to express it in an easy way. Um, and so he's talking about this and you, you know, you have people tuning into that, uh, that town hall, they're getting exactly what the, the, the Biden narrative is like a guy who, you know, is you know, sort of technocratic a little bit. I mean, like just what we expect out of a politician, right? Like just sort of like has ideas how to fix things. Right. Right. Um, 
two things, man. Again, when you compare it to Amy Coney Barrett, like you said, like, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it, Joe Biden. Like, I, and when you compare it to Donald Trump, I'm like, yeah, I, I appreciate the possibility of waking up one morning without existential dread because the president is, is, is pushing us over the edge into the abyss, like having fun doing it from his golden toilet that I'm sure he had transported down to the White House. Like, I, I, I really look forward to a, a day where we don't have a news cycle that, um, one day of a news cycle that normally would take up a month uh, in any normal times. That said, when you compare it to the, the, what has to be done, um, it, it's still in and of itself insufficient, which isn't to attack him. Like I said, I appreciate him. Compared to Amy Coney Barrett, thank you. But in terms of what needs to be done, in terms of what's being proposed from the left, I think this goes back to the first part of our conversation. Uh, it would behoove them to bring us to the table and not try to distance themselves so much from the Green New Deal, because quite frankly, the Green New Deal is, um, is incremental in its own way. And so it's not tenable in the long run for uh, a Joe Biden style policy to help solve solutions because we'll run out of time, quite frankly. But if you if we let these other monsters stay in power, then our time frame is going to be even shorter and we won't be able to get anything done. So I, I look at Joe Biden as a stopgap measure. What right. he was saying on uh, uh, the rainforest is absolutely accurate. And in a way, it is a brilliant stopgap measure. But we got to go beyond that. So let's stop the bleeding with Joe Biden and his piecemeal half, half, not haphazard. I think haphazard is unfair, but half assed is not unfair uh, measures. And then we have to make a pivot towards the right direction, uh, which is the left. I, I almost think that his measures are three quarter. Uh, ass. <laughs> but regardless, the 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 thing that is exciting is that in the event that the Democrats take control of the Senate and the House yes. and the presidency, yes. the debate is not going to be between Joe Biden's proposal and whether climate change is real or we just exactly. need to leave it to a deity to solve. It's going to be between Joe Biden's plan and then the Green yeah. New Deal. So our solution is more than likely going to end up somewhere in between there, which right. is better than it ending up somewhere oh. over here or not a, non-existent whatsoever. Yeah. All right, I, let's, let's flip the channel, as it were, as if we were in real time. Hey, we just heard Joe Biden talk about the, uh, you know, talk about the dynamic of carbon and sinking. Let's tune in to see what uh, Donald Trump is talking about. Oh, he's pretending he doesn't know what QAnon is. Let's look at this. Down our cities that are run by Democrats who don't All right, know what While we're doing. denouncing, let me ask you about QAnon. It is this theory that uh, Democrats are a satanic pedophile ring and that you are the savior of that. Now, can you just once and for all state that that is completely not true so and disavow QAnon yeah. in its entirety? I know nothing about QAnon. I just told I you. I know very little. You told me, but what you tell me doesn't necessarily make it fact. I hate to say that. I know nothing about it. I do know they are very much against uh, pedophilia. They fight it very hard, but I know nothing they about it. They believe it, it is if a satanic like call to run by the deep state. The subject, I'll tell you what I do know about. I know about Antifa, and I know about the radical left, and I know how violent they are and how vicious they are, and I know how they're burning down cities run by Democrats, not run Republican by Republicans. Republican Senator Ben Sass said, quote, QAnon is nuts, and real leaders call conspiracy theories conspiracy theories. He may be Why right. not just say it's crazy and not true? He may be right i just don't know about QAnon. you do know i don't know no i don't know i don't know you let me ask me you another thing it. let's waste the whole show uh you start off with white supremacy i denounce it you start off with something else let's go keep asking me these questions okay. i but, do have but, one let, more let me just thing. let me just tell you what i do hear about it is they are very strongly against pedophilia and i agree with that i mean i do agree okay. with that and i agree but with there's it not a strongly. satanic uh, pedophile i have no they idea i know you don't know that? that? Okay. No, I don't know you that. You just this week. neither do you know that. Okay, just this week. Why, you why retreated. aren't you asking me about Antifa? Why aren't you asking me about just, the radical you, left? You're why are you asking Joe Biden questions about why doesn't he condemn Antifa? Why does he say it doesn't exist? Because you're here Antifa, before me. No, she's <laughs> so cute. Antifa exists. They're vicious. Mm. And Dixon? Mm. Um, mm -mm. 
your sense of of <laughs> how much Donald Trump knows about QAnon? Uh, I, I think he, he, I would argue that Donald Trump spends time on QAnon websites um, because, you know, I, I have to actually say something. I have known for some time that Donald Trump isn't as dumb as he pretends to be. Um, but what, what, you, what I saw in that exchange, I actually have to commend him on being intellectually nimble to play this game. Now, don't get me wrong. It's, it's intellectually dishonest. And this is what a con man is able to do. They're able to spin on a dime easily. That's how they get their con accomplished. But I, I think it should, goes to show how calculating he is. The way he, he pivoted on those questions, held the line, it's a classic thing that a con man does, but it should show every single American, particularly Democrats in Washington, DC, that Donald Trump is cold, meticulous, and calculating on every single thing that he does. And we've given him the benefit of the doubt to say, oh, he's such a moron. No, actually he's not. He is a calculating narcissistic sociopath who will burn this country to the ground. And he's not willing to distance himself be, uh, from QAnon because he knows exactly how much, he knows enough about them to know that they're a core part of his constituency. Yeah, I found it sort of fascinating that he could have just said, like, I know nothing about them and ended right. right there. And when she was about to pivot, he said, but I do know exactly. against pedophilia. <laughs> yes. Like, so he gives them a bone, right? He gives them something to latch on to. When you have supporters, uh, th th what they need from you more than anything else is just, just give us anything. Don't abandon us completely. If you just give us one thing, we'll forgive everything else bad that you said about us. So the white supremacists uh, that he quote unquote denounced, you know, they're, they are still hanging on, stand ready and stand by, right? Or stand back and stand by. They're clinging on to that because they want to support him and they think that he has to make these denunciations, which he has to do. So that's what he's doing. When he say, I know they're against pedophilia and they're all cheering and rejoicing because they're like, yes, we're against pedophilia. Never mind the fact that we ignore the fact that Donald Trump had a really good relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah, the uh, uh, the right has always been good about this. Sean, uh, uh, Rush Limbaugh many times will say like, you know, of course, he's got to deny, you know, not in this instance about QAnon, but generally the idea of like, he's of course, he's got to deny because he'll get roasted by the mainstream media. But he mm -hmm. clearly is with us on blah, blah. That exactly. is that that construct is um, is pretty quite common. All right. We're going to take just a uh, a quick break. And when we come back, uh, get another clip of uh, Donald Trump. I want to play you. Did you know, Ben, and we will discuss this when we return, that Donald Trump has a uh, health care plan for us? <laughs> it's pretty exciting. We'll Just right like back. his plan for Black America. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Ben uh, mentioned uh, just before we took that uh, quick break that um, Donald Trump has a, a plan for uh, health care in America. Yeah. And, you know, this is where I feel like um, he could have been pushed just a little bit more by Savannah Guthrie. I mean, there was enough of, a, you know, enough was communicated that the administration is pursuing the end of Obamacare. And mm. I think, you know, fortunately for uh, Democrats, the race is not in a month or two, because I think the whole pre-existing conditions thing, the, the Republicans have finally figured out a way of dealing with that. Uh, yeah. And, you know, that being the surrogate for the entire uh, Obamacare, the expansion of Medicaid, the whole patient protection rights. But here is uh, Trump answering a question about uh, health care with pre-existing conditions, and I can't say that more strongly, but we've been able to bring health care costs way down. Now, I took over Obamacare, got rid of the individual mandate, made it good, managed it much better. Remember, they had the $5 billion uh, website disaster and all of the problems they had. The problem with Obamacare, it's not good. We'd like to terminate it, and we want a much less expensive health care that's a much better health care, and that's where we're aiming. And if we can do that, and we have a very good chance of doing it, but we've also brought down the price of Ob Obamacare. Problem with Obamacare, it basically is never going to be great. And I want to give great health care. Mr. It's so President, important. I got to thank you very much. On the pre-existing conditions, this is such a big issue for voters. It is a big issue for me, too. In point of fact, your administration... And she goes on to say, in point of fact, you're, 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 um, you're suing right now. And of course, um, the fact is, just saying we want better and less expensive health care, that's not a plan. 
Right, right. That, that's what he's been able to get away with. That's what used car salesmen, and oh, no offense to used car salesmen, right? But that's what that kind of trope, they're able to sell you anything. And Donald Trump has been able to get away with that type of reasoning or lack of reasoning, this kind of argument uh, for the longest time, because you know I don't know how much his supporters actually care that they have had four years to give us that healthcare plan and they haven't given us anything. And so I think it's kind of ironic that they're making all these promises in the ninth hour when they had, they had two years uh, when they had the House of Representatives, the Senate and the White House, and they had the ability to give us that healthcare plan then and they haven't done it. Uh, healthcare seems to be the um, the thing that the Democrats are running on. Again, it was very effective in 2018. Uh, they opened up the Amy Coney uh, Barrett hearings talking about the ACA. Um, this general, you know, I mean, the specifics of the ACA, I think, again, we talk about, um, you know, necessary but inadequate or insufficient. Uh, that is a, a great um I think a description of the uh, Obamacare and in many, and at least in the context of making the product decent on the, on the cost side, I don't think it's really done much to be honest with you, unless you're eligible for Medicaid, in which case that has been uh, very successful. Um, I, I think in terms of expansion, hopefully a couple more States will pick it up as well. Uh, but give me a sense. I mean, I know you're a former Georgian. Um, you had spent at least a couple of years there. Georgia now has just moved into um, into the sort of lightly shaded blue column, yeah. as it were, which is pretty shocking. And uh, Donald Trump is headed there, I think, uh, this weekend for a, a rally. Give me a sense of and I know you, you haven't been there in, in some time, but in Georgia, like how does the health care play? Like when 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 you got Ossoff and you've got uh, Warnick and they're talking and they're they're running in these two races. Georgia has two Senate races uh, because of of you know the for a whole myriad of reasons like a special election they held it right. off. That's so lawful. How does that play to people there? Just the idea of healthcare, just the healthcare anxiety. Yeah, um, when I was there, there was there were plenty of um, of people. Oddly enough. Not oddly enough, I'm sorry, it's the exact opposite. It's the same phenomenon that you see across the country that a lot of people simply never thought Obamacare was the Affordable Care Act because of you know obvious political reasons and, and, and bad branding. I think we have to lay some of that at, at the Obama administration. But when they actually start realizing that there are some key benefits that they actually benefited from directly. You know, we saw that. We, we saw that in, um, in, in Georgia. I actually have a friend who's still doing some work down there um, with black male voters, and, and they see that very expressly, right? There's a, uh, one of the reasons Georgia is starting to turn blue is because there's a lot of groundwork that's being done in two specific categories, informing people about um, the move that the Republicans are making on the Affordable Care Act. First of all, letting them know that Affordable Care Act is Obamacare, and then pointing out how they have been beneficiaries of the Affordable Care Act and, and Obamacare. You would be surprised how many years has Obamacare been around and they did not realize that the reason that they can keep their 26-year-old on their insurance, the reason that they, they can keep their child who had pre-existing conditions on their insurance was because of the Affordable Care Act and uh, Obamacare. So there's just a, a really a, a tremendous dearth of information. And of course, that's intentional, right? That's been the strategy. And what they've been counting on, they being the Republicans, has been, especially in Georgia, has been to appeal to the pure hatred of Obama. And that hatred kind of blinded a lot of people to the fact that, oh, you're really getting ready to shoot yourself in the foot uh, with the second term of this Republican Party. You know, it's funny because, uh, and I've said this many times, and I can't even remember what the, uh, what the second half of the, but it, the official name of the Affordable Care Act uh, was the ACA PP, I think it was I, um, Patients protection. Yes. Uh, yeah. Something along those lines. And, and, and I have always said that it was the patient protection side that actually worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you put aside the expansion of Medicaid, which I think, you know, only for the sake of this argument, I think it's actually on the balance, probably the best part of uh, the, the act was the expansion of Medicaid. But in terms of, of everyone else in the country, it was the PPACA, I guess, Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, right. was the actual name of the of the bill, and they focused on the affordable, affordable. care part, 
which was ludicrous because first off, the Affordable Care Part only applied to either the 10 million people who got Medicaid or the 10 million people who bought it on exchanges. The affordable, the word affordable was never going to implicate anybody else in the entire country. The PP part of it, a patient protection, that, it, that, that touched everyone. Right. That, that is the part of the bill where, like you say, if you're 26 years old, you're on your parents' uh, thing. It ends uh, rescission. There's no lifetime limits. There's no year-long limits. There's no, um, there's no pre-existing uh, conditions. There are basic aspects of health insurance that you must have to have it considered health insurance, like right. you know, a mammogram or a colonoscopy, that type of thing. And so that was the part that was really, I think, undersold. And um, that's why I think there was such disillusion with it because everybody's going around going like, my health insurance is not, is not affordable. It's right. not, you know, it, 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 the, the rate, the cost curve may have bent in cer a certain way, but it's still not affordable. Uh, yeah. you know, that, and, and everybody's walking around going like it did not deliver and they don't make the connection between those things. Yeah. It, it's gotta be, you know, if we, if we get the luxury of going back to a time when we could actually sit down and retrospect, look at the mistakes of a previous administration, right? Because that's a luxury at this point. If we don't give it to Donald Trump, we're not going to have that luxury. But if we ever get that luxury again, we got to sit down and have some courses on the absolute failure in the marketing of the Patient Protection Act, because I think you did more service for the people, for the Pro Patients Protection and Affordable Care Act in this last five minutes than they did in the entirety of its existence. Yeah, it is unfortunate. And uh, apparently the, um, uh, the, unsubsidized ACA exchange population declined by 45% over the past mm. four years. Now, um, a lot of that could have been like no, uh, no pressure from a mandate um, or it could have just been, they got priced out and, and, and we, you know, it's, it's hard to assess that, but it's, it's the wrong direction. Right. And mm. so something has to change during the Biden administration that is going to address this. And that is going to be one of those, there's going to be a bunch of jump balls, right? during this administration if it happens now again you know you and i sit here we can't really know what's happening we look at right. the polls but the big question is did donald trump uh, inspire and we've seen some data indicating that there's been uh, an increase in registration among non-college educated white uh, people for the most part those tend to be trump voters and so you and I don't know. I guess the only thing that we can tell people is, you know, go out there, tell your friends, tell your family, um, tell five people, text a bunch of people, particularly in those swing states, go out, vote. Vote early uh, if you can, but vote, vote, vote. Ben Dixon of the Benjamin Dixon Show. People can find your show where? Right here on YouTube and wherever, everywhere you're streaming uh, for the most part. Um, and they can get the uh, podcast anywhere you find podcasts. All right, Ben Dixon, appreciate uh, your time. Benjamin Dixon. Thanks for having so, me, man. Folks, check Always that a pleasure. Out. All right, well, we are wrapping up our uh, first hour of our program. Again, you know, we are 18 days out. It is very difficult right now to assess the race. We know what the national polls say, but um, we know what they said last time too. I think at this time, four years ago, I was talking to guests who were saying there's about a 99.9% .9 chance that Hillary Clinton will win. I guess it turned out to be closer to 87%. And sometimes those long shots come in. So uh, make sure you go out and vote. Um, we're going to uh, end our first hour and uh, say goodbye to our viewers who are uh, just watching that first hour. We'll see you on Monday. And for those of you who are sticking around, we have a special treat. Um, let's bring on my old friend, uh, David Rees first. Uh, he, for those of you who are long time listeners of this program, long time, super old, you'll remember, uh, get your war on. This was, um, one of the few means of dissent that we had back in the day during the Iraq war. David Rees now is the, uh, the co-host, one of the co-hosts of, of Election Profit Makers. He also uh, is um, a co-creator of Dicktown 
on FXX uh, with uh, John Hodgman. And of course, uh, my new fighting technique is unstoppable. David Rees, long time, no see. Sam, how are you? I'm doing uh, great. How are you? What? Uh, Never what... better. Love and life. Yeah, things going great for you? Yeah, man. No complaints. No complaints. Irie, 420, every day, all day. <laughs> I thought you had uh, a mustache. I thought you grew a COVID mustache, no? I did, I did, but I got, I got rid of it. Yeah, I see you did. You grew, you grew yours. Yeah. I, yeah, uh, no. Something to do. You know, it's good to pick up new hobbies. Right. Ivanka Trump was learning how to read Greek or something, and she said, this is a great time for everyone to learn new skills. So I thought, all right, I'll try to grow a Greek mustache. And, and, and I'm glad to uh, see that that uh, that worked out. Um, yeah. I was just telling uh, some on the crew that um, that I wish that we had our carpenter pencils that are now mm. available at uh, shop.majorityreportradio.com. Are you serious? Back in the day, because you are, of course, I think people will remember, um, if not uh, the foremost authority on pencil sharpening, maybe the only authority on uh, pencil sharpening in the world. I would put myself in the top quintile of pencil sharpening experts. Yeah. But Just I in the quintile. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm in, the only expert, no. I'll, thanks to my, entrepreneur, my entrepreneurialshipness, the uh, art and craft of pencil sharpening have never been more popular. Again, it's a great COVID activity. I'm surprised Ivanka Trump didn't suggest it to her Twitter followers. <laughs> Now's a great so, time to really learn how to sharpen pencils at home with your children. It would have been great. It would have been a great thing for her to do, but there's still, yeah. uh, sadly, I think going to be more time as we head into the, uh, the winter. Well, right. all right. So let's, let's get down to brass tacks. Um, when you're not doing a show Dick town mm -hmm. with uh, John Hodgman, mm -hmm. um, you apparently have a podcast that you've revised. Should we, should we bring on your um on your co-host? Yeah, I feel exposed without my two co-hosts. Um, your two co-hosts, uh, Starley Kine and uh, John Kimball. And uh, we'll wait for them to connect. I see Starley's got... Uh, Here we go. Starley? Coming online, coming online. It's great to have you on... Oh, she didn't hear. Starley, it's great to have you on the I, show. Uh, I listened to a Murder Show... No, Murder Show. Mystery Show. <laughs> murder um, She Wrote. <laughs> yeah. Mystery She Wrote. Mystery She Wrote. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I still podcasted. I have, I have, uh, like, like it's, it's, it's weird. But when I think about your show, I, I think of a specific location walking on Flatbush Avenue because I would walk to work uh, and 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 do that. And which, which, um, which part of Flatbush? I love, I love the memories of where, of where I, of, I know, I, I, I've, I've, I've experienced that too. It's, uh, it's the, yeah. near the Donut Factory. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I, I mean, great I don't know what great else place to listen to it. Great. That, I, I don't know why that sticks out. And yeah. uh, let's bring on your your third uh, co-host, John Kimball, who apparently this is the first time he's ever used uh, his webcam. Uh, and <laughs> and has not put in his uh, earplugs yet. Uh, he and he's, he's, he's <laughs> this is and so this is how the this show is goes. Very much. Uh, yes. Yeah. All right. Well, Starly, it's kind of our you, brand. Yeah. Okay. Why don't Why don't you tell us uh, about election uh, profit makers while while John gets sort of settled here? Has um, Has David told you anything about it? No, no, nothing. he oh. hasn't said a single word about it. We, we no. were just We were just talking about pencils. What's uh -huh. Does John always do this? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> he's he's kind of too cool for school. Yeah. yeah. No, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's try and wrap this up before he actually gets plugged in. Uh, so, start. Well, tell us about uh, uh, election profit makers because I know this was like this is like version two of the show, right? Yeah, version two, season two. It's the it's the sequel that where we get our revenge. All right. Well, well, tell us about the 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 I guess the original and then the sequel as well. Well, we started doing. We did the first season um, seventeen weeks before the two thousand sixteen presidential election. David and John had the idea because John was using predict it to win money off people who supported Trump, who he thought were fools mm. and who to be investing money in, in Trump's victory. And then I guess David had the idea to um, turn it into a podcast and he came to me and said, would I help with that? And then we started recording it in my kitchen. We recorded the whole first season in my kitchen 
And season two is supposed to be up, upgrading to getting a studio and then a pandemic hit. So we're back to recording the podcast in our kitchens. There you go. Well, yeah. Sam, do you know what Predicted is? Do you, do you trade on Predicted.org? I, I have traded on Predicted.org. Really? But why don't we let okay. John explain oh, really? Predicted to us since he lost so much money last time on it. Right. Yeah. So the, and the premise is that we all John, bet on <laughs> figured out his computer. How do you guys produce the show every week? It's a it's a breeze. It's yeah. it's, it's definitely easy and John always <laughs> an image of him just shaking his head like he can't do anything. All right. John well, spends 90% of his time on his phone exclusively trading on predicted. Yeah. All right. And well, so, so whenever David, he has why don't you, to use his laptop, this. Starley's actually taking a picture of how yeah. ridiculous like, this is. It's like somebody trying to shoot a web video using an abacus. Like when yeah. he tries to use his laptop, he completely shuts down. All right. Well, well like Matt, Matt, please uh, mute his uh, his microphone so that we can actually just sort of like extend this out. But okay. David, wh- um, what? So all right. So what is predicted for people don't know? Predicted is an Australian website where people buy and sell shares of political futures, basically news events happening or not happening. It's like a stock market for politics, and the reason that it is allowed legally in the United States is because technically it's an academic study on, I guess, the wisdom of crowds and different ways of forecasting political events. I mean, who believes that? Well, we do, Sam. We do. Yeah, we believe it. You believe that it's an academic uh, exercise? Sure. Whatever gets you through the night, you know, whatever (laughs) allows you to whatever allows you to trade on it. And the other thing is that there's a limit. There's a, you can, any, any single investor can only put $850 into a single market. Bracket, single bracket in a market. Single bracket within Because the I've actually recently realized that I had it wrong this whole time. Cause I was oh, like right. betting you against. Guys it takes time to learn. Oh, well, well just, look at this. Wow. Who's decided to join us? <laughs> wow. Uh, John I, I, uh, sorry. Yeah. Tim Cook. Now, your expert is logged on. Hey, look, I'm technically proficient in the markets, but not with my computer. So. Well, are you technically com- <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, proficient in the markets, John? My understanding is that you blew like the show, like basically you bankrupt the show, the first mm-hmm. version. Is that right? Yes, that's true. But but everybody was wrong in 2016. So, um, but yes, you're right. I, I lost a lot of money in. Uh, Nate's in 2016, bank. and I'm gonna make it all back this time. I'm I'm hoping. All right. Well, so how does this work? Okay. So, John, since you you've decided to join us, what um <laughs> what, what how does this like? Okay. So you guys get on your show and you talk about like bets that you've made. Like I, I'm sorry. How is this like? What is the, what is the value of this to us, John? So, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, we started a, this as a way to deal with our anxiety, but these are tough times, and it, I think it's a great opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. John? Have you guys ever been able to produce a single episode of this thing? No, but what? we're really looking forward to recording yeah. our first episode. Politics. Yeah. Great. Look at yeah. now he's spe- sped up. What, this has what, never happened. I think maybe you guys, all right. So like David, yeah. why don't you explain okay. to us okay. now? Let's take it again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sam, I understand your skepticism. Uh-huh. I totally get where you're coming from. It's a great question. I'd be happy to answer it. Well, thank you. No. Basically it's a show about the state of the world and politics mm-hmm. where the lens through which we talk about all this stuff is our portfolio on predicted.org. Mm-hmm. So we do a lot of the same stuff that a lot of, you know, center left to hard left podcasts do. We make fun of politicians. We gripe and we groan about the state of the world. We think the president is a big dummy. Sometimes we're less than enthusiastic about the Biden campaign. But throughout all of those, you know, wonderful conversations that we're having to the delight and amusement of all, we're also literally putting our money where our mouth is. Unlike most pundits who never Mm. actually pay a price for being catastrophically wrong. Mm. You might remember this, Sam, from the days of the Iraq war, as long as we're taking a trip way back machine. People can get things stupendously wrong and still keep their jobs and suffer no consequences. Mm. So one of the points of election profit makers was, all right, we don't know much. We don't know any more or less than any other pundit. We can all talk out of our asses like pundits, but at the very least, let's have the integrity to actually suffer if we get things wrong. 
So for instance, yeah. on the night of the 2016 election, like John said, just about everybody called that wrong. The difference was that cumul- cumulative, we lost thousands of dollars on that night, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whereas Wolf Blitzer probably went home and slept like a baby. At least right. we had the integrity and, to lose a bunch of money. And people are profiting off politics every day. And it, we're living in this capitalist society where everyone's just making money off of running, being president or showing the president n- nonstop. So at least we like, it's actually, I feel like the purest way to engage, to, to engage with that. It's, it's, it's creating a greater stakes, but on a day-to-day basis, John, if you're here with us now, um, uh, do you, I think I am, do you, uh, do you guys, is it just like, you're just going to pay the price on uh, election day? Or are you guys doing like, uh, by September one, the polls are going to be like this, or, I mean, and, and, and are you doing other races? I, I, <laughs> he froze again. He froze again. There's John's in the past. Oh, damn. Oh, my God. All right, just put a uh, I'm image. Sorry. Yeah. Darling, yeah. What, so, so how did so, that work? So I feel that, um, I feel like the smart, John has all these ways where he's betting on it. He's hedging and he's betting. No matter if whoever wins, he's going to not lose money again somehow. I feel like I'm back to where I was last time where all of my money is just tied up in whether Trump loses. Like, oh, I wait, can't. So- yeah. So, so, David, are you guys? Do you necessarily have to bet a certain amount each week? Is that what's going on? No, there? no, 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 no. No, David bets the, pennies. I yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a real spendthrift. I don't have a lot of liquid assets right now, so I don't have nearly as much invested in the market as Starley or John. I think John has thousands of dollars. We have one we have one listener who I know has you know almost forty thousand dollars invested across all of Predictit.org. Some of the markets will resolve the morning after the election if all goes according to plan. Some of the markets resolve at the end of a week if it comes down to polling numbers. And then obviously, just like the stock market, you can buy and sell shares whenever you want. It's just a matter of somebody uh, meeting your ask price. So for yeah. instance, months and months ago, I went long on Jamie Harrison beating Lindsey Graham. Mm-hmm. I just had a good feeling and I thought it would be fun to throw some dollars down the wishing well against Lindsey Graham. And, you know, it was looking like a good investment for a while. It was moving up and up. But recently, I think in the last, maybe it's the power of Dianne Feinstein hugging Lindsey Graham and legitimizing the the Amy Coney Barrett hearings. But now I'm underwater on Jamie Harrison. And I'm kind of thinking like, I don't know, maybe it's time to sell. Like, just get out and eat the loss. You don't have to wait until the election to... to Ah, and you can also hedge like I have all this money tied up in how many if, if Biden were to win how many electoral college the electoral college margin he would win by it all hinges on him still winning but I have like money and it, it's so cheap right now that I have money in all the different a bunch of different markets and you guys in the meantime are also raising money for um, that are for organizations that are helping get people to the polls right yeah, that was not the point of the podcast. That was kind of an, something we stumbled into. So sometimes during the course of the podcast, I'll get really frustrated with a listener. Maybe someone is sending us too many emails or something, and I will like, quote unquote, ban that listener. And they're forbidden, they're forbidden from listening to the podcast. And it, uh, a few, I guess about a month ago, a month and a half ago, there were quite a few listeners that I had banned. And then somebody was complaining about how I was being mean about Nancy Pelosi. And I said, okay, I'm going to be more positive from now until the end of the election. And David Graber had just died. I don't know if you knew him, Sam. Um, But, you know, he was involved with Astra Taylor and some other folks in the Rolling Jubilee where they were getting rid of uh, medical debt and, you know, all that stuff. And that was a project I'd been involved in. So I said, okay, in the honor of David Graber, we're going to have a ban Jubilee. This is a big tent now. Everyone is welcome. I'm rescinding and canceling all listener bans. Everyone can listen to our wonderful podcast. Let's just get across the finish line. Then I got an email from a listener who was mad that we had forgiven all the bans because he really wanted us to ban his friend. So I said to this listener, all right, give whatever, 50 bucks to fairfight.org and I'll ban your friend live on the air. Like an old school, like radio requests, you know, long distance dedication. And then it spiraled out of control and people started writing in and donating money and asking that we ban people like there's banning brothers and parents banning children and children banning parents and all this kind of stuff. Um, Somebody banned Bruno Mars from listening because I hate Mars because of its association with Elon Musk. Like people have been doing a lot of really creative bans. 
Yeah, and and initially we thought it was going to raise like five hundred dollars, but now as of this week, we're over twenty thousand dollars. Oh, that's fantastic. Which so it started as a goof and then it kind of spiraled out of control. And now all day, all I do is read these bands and try to rewrite these band dedications so that the shows aren't four hours long. And, and the so first now, season- Starly, you have no listeners practically, right? Because that's, they've all been banned. Yeah, that's the goal. The goal is to have the, it's, it's to be the only podcast that has no listeners at the end of its run. Zero listeners by election night, zero hosts. That's our goal. Yeah. But we Please can't. Us. I feel like John has already got a jump on both of you. <laughs> Maybe he got a fat donation that we don't know about, and he's self banning. And this is just his. This is his spectacular self ban. It would yeah, take a lot to. Silence. It would take a lot to ban. We've all. So many people have put money in to protect us from being banned. Oh, that's true. You can also would take, donate to protect. Like someone yeah. donated a thousand dollars to protect Starly from being banned. Mm-hmm. So, by by whom? Do you have the authority to ban your your fellow co-hosts? They could have banned me or a listener could have banned, but we now have layers of protection because they keep giving more money to protect us from some clever. How, mu- how much did it cost to ban John's internet connection? That might have just been an executive decision by Comcast. Mm-hmm. They might just be like throttling him. <laughs> you know how social media is, is shutting down conservative voices and free thought? Yes. Uh, this might be somebody retaliating against John Kimball. Centrist Kimball. <laughs> someone is someone wants to shut down neoliberal centrist mm-hmm. thought, mm-hmm. and they're and they're sabotaging his internet. He's frozen no. again. No. Yeah. Oh, oh there we oh. go. He's frozen, but speaking. His image is frozen. He's yeah. doing or either that or he's doing like some ventriloquism. That's pretty good. I didn't yeah. even see your mouth. Uh, I'm, he's sorry. Lo- I'm, he's lo- I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so right sorry. Now. Yeah. Loving life right now. Sam, we, we'll this tell you. definitely it's a not his podcast. biggest nightmare. There's definitely no technical issues. It's a lot of fun. We all speak uh, and can communicate clearly with each other when we're firing on all cylinders. And yeah. Uh, yeah. We so, really wait have- a second. so how are you guys recording it? Is it basically like this, except for theoretically <laughs> you're all connected? <laughs> what we do is yeah. we use Zoom and we mm-hmm. also use our microphones. And uh, garage, we have GarageBand, not to brag, but most of us use GarageBand. Um, I use Pro Tools. Oh, right. See, oh, so you guys record on your own ends. And, yeah. and, then, yeah. uh, and then it all gets synced. We go to time.is and we all clap at a certain time. I don't know if you folks do that at the majority report. What is it called? Time.is. It's a wonderful internet clock. And everyone is seeing the same time at the same, you know, at the same time so to speak and they'll say okay at 12 35 05 everybody clap and then you can sync up your audio it's a it's like a slate oh interesting it's interesting fine. uh it i hope it works better it. than this because uh that must take a lot of editing work to do oh my god so- john is no oh, this you sam so john and i have known each other since seventh grade we've been friends for over 35 years and this experience today on the majority report i'm so happy because i know i can ride this basically until retirement age. Right. You're going to have John this. John is never going to live this down. His triumphant debut on the majority report. <laughs> this is going to be. Uh, Marcel Marceau you... in effect. Just yeah. like. <laughs> so now wait a second. So what happens? Is the show over on November? I mean, maybe it's November 3rd, but maybe it's November 5th or November 8th or, or what happens? So. The season one, like Starley mentioned, we recorded our last episode the morning after the uh, uh, election. That was our final episode. And that was just a great fun episode that I- I bet you that must've been so much yeah, fun for you guys. I would guys. love yeah. to listen to that episode. I think I was like literally sobbing on, on the microphone. Yeah. Um, this season, I kind of want to go at least until Biden's inauguration because mm-hmm. I actually think the crazy zone is actually, let's assume yeah. Trump loses. I think the real crazy stuff that's going to happen is that dead space, you know, between the yeah. election and the inauguration. Yeah. Because then Trump, like, I, there's literally nothing I can't imagine Trump doing in those yeah. couple months, just out of spite or for financial gain. And the you know? show, the show that will be put on, like the, the amount of crazy we're going to be subjected to in listen, hearing him say, it'll be, I think a lot of people, it's interesting, like, we, the last time, you know, Trump got COVID, the debates happened and then he got COVID. And so that happened so fast that we actually never talked about that debate on the show. <laughs> and some people have written to us and been like, I didn't get a chance to process that debate because you didn't cover it. And I think that is sometimes the role of the show that people need to hear it being discussed. Because it's not like we come out 
It's not even like it comes out right as the events are happening. And I feel like that a period between the election and the inauguration, we're going to be, first of all, processing a lot of trauma and there's, they're going to be gloves will be off. And that seems to, we will be needed. All all, are all needed. In the event that, uh, that Donald Trump loses. Um, Well, I mean, (laughs) yeah. I mean, that's the thing, right? I mean, it's, it's almost, um, impossible on one hand i don't want to entertain the idea of 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 trump losing because i don't want to get ahead of myself too much although you know ben dixon and i were talking about from a political standpoint the fight to uh influence the transition and the the first couple of years of, of a biden administration and i think that's worthwhile to do but like i'm not letting myself go to that place where it's like i'm even thinking about sort of secondary aspects of it right yeah. But the place that I cannot go, that I have been completely unable to access, and I don't see any even, I don't even see any value in it on some level, is um, registration of non-college white guys in um, Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania is up, and Donald Trump wins by twenty thousand in Pennsylvania and five thousand in Wisconsin and four thousand in Michigan and or something popular, like that. And something. wins a popular vote or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I think yeah. Joe Biden wins the popular vote. I don't think that's yeah. I, I think that's almost impossible to imagine any other scenario. But like I have not been able to even contemplate. The the scenario of of, of Trump winning, like it's just too disturbing on some level, like I don't even know where, where you start with something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's weird, though, because it feels like we can't there's no you can't contemplate that happening, but there's also like you can't speak about Trump losing because then it, it it all feels like jinxy. It's very hard to, to it's it, it's very it's it's it, we, we've talked about this. It's like a totally different feeling than last time, where all you were doing was talking about how it was like the election was coming and there was constant cover. I mean, there's constant coverage now, but now it's like it's almost as it gets so close, you almost don't want to speak about it at all because you can't entertain if it goes wrong and you are afraid to hope for it to go right. How much of the show is, I mean, when you started, you guys started this out, how much of it was also to sort of expose just the enormous amount of money? I mean, I guess you mentioned this a little bit up front, but it just, um, the, the enormous amount of, of, of money that is generated off this. And I, and I, you know, obviously like it's an indictment on some level of, of what I do too, right? Like, uh, this is the way I, I, I am not necessarily just election profit making but um i am you know politics profit making i'm like a, a barnacle on you know the uh, the good ship um uh, i guess or the sinking ship of body politics. politics right that's why we always manage to never make any money so at least we have that integrity wins again I yeah mean, i don't know i feel i mean haplessly i don't feel nearly as cynical or disgusted by like the left-wing podcast industry as I do with, you know, cable news. I mean, the money is just, it, there's no comparison, right? And um, I think even the biggest political podcasts are absolutely probably, this is just me talking with no knowledge, but I, the biggest political podcasts are probably absolutely dwarfed by the smallest political TV shows. You know, it's, when you're talking someone like even like Tim Pool. I'm yeah. willing to wager that Tim Pool generates more revenue on his show than the vast majority of cable news talkers make. Really? Yeah. Wow. You the Tim Pool, your 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 um, debate partner, your buddy. We're 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 having a little bit of the miscommunication Some logistical issues as of late. Yeah. We're getting, right. but I mean, I think there are people out there. I mean, who are making that kind of uh, of money in this space? Um, mm. I mean, he is, I think, sort of uh, particularly. You know, you, you, I mean, Joe Rogan. I wouldn't call him a political podcaster, but right. Uh, but he sways. He got. He's got influence. Uh, and he, he he operates in that space to some extent and he makes you know uh, a huge million multi-million dollar deals so david let me ask you this just because you and i first met in 2004 or 2005 i guess and it was in the context i think of of get your war on uh certainly air i mean Ameri- I, air, air america day speaking of incredibly financially lucrative media outlets yes and that and uh, crashed and burned we're on air um america. 
what, like, give me your sense of like comparing that era to this one. Bush versus Trump. Who is the worst president? That type of stuff? Well, no, I'm not even talking about Bush and Trump. I'm talking more about like the, I mean, one of the things that I, I've noticed or that I noticed through this year is that, or through the Trump years is, you know, obviously I left comedy, uh, joined Janine to do the original majority report and thought it was going to be temporary. And I just, I, I, I like this, this, I found this a little bit more fulfilling in many respects, but we both had friends and agents and managers and other comedians who are like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, why are you doing this? Like, why are you so str Like, what is the, you know, like why, like, I remember going to dinner parties and just like, you know, not many, I didn't get invited to many, but <laughs> to the extent that I would get invited to a dinner party and, you know, somebody would say like, oh, you know, like we would be talking about something and then I would just like, just regret, you know, like just basically vomit over the table, all of this horrible things that George Bush was doing in the Iraq Actually, war. the Downing Street memo proves conclusively that yeah, Tony I mean, Blair was complicit. In but it was also yeah, like, you know, like the Clean Air Act, whatever it was. Right. And people would just look at me like, what is wrong with you, man? And this era, it's almost the opposite dynamic where all of those people who are like, what are you doing with your life are texting me like, did you see this? <laughs> like, I don't go anywhere where people right. don't have at least, you know, some measure of parity or more knowledge of what's going on than I do. Right. And it's completely flipped. And you, you know, were at least, you know, you were a, a constant critic of that era through get your war on. And I, you know, obviously it's a little bit different cause you're not, you know, sitting there and doing the, um, doing the strip at, at a dinner party and people are going like, Hey, David, could you put away your, <laughs> what, like, uh -huh. I mean, could you not do that here? Right. I mean, but, but I mean, what, I'm just curious that like, what do you make of that? I think it's a great example of how actual personality and politics actually matters. I think I've learned a couple things from the Trump presidency, or I, I should say I haven't learned. Well, I've learned things. And what I mean by that is I've realized that my, I had some fundamental assumptions about politics that were completely mistaken. Back in the Bush administration, during the Iraq war, post 9-11 era, when I was doing the cartoon, I really had kind of a Noam Chomsky view of it. You know, sometimes when you read Noam Chomsky, it's this kind of bloodless analytic attitude of the personalities of politicians don't matter. This is all just, this is all comes down to states exercising power and realpolitik. And who's in charge doesn't matter because these are fundamental forces about self-interest that will just grind innocent people and spit them out the other end, you know? No and, model. I used to really, really believe that. And then with Trump, I feel like he's just, <laughs> he's just so disgusting. He's just such a tacky, cruel, hateful, ignorant asshole that I think a lot of people, that's the hook for a lot of people. And then they're so appalled by his personality and his behavior that then his policies are seen immediately as a reflection of that depravity, right? And so I do think, I don't wanna be one of those people who's like, hey, you know, Obama actually droned innocent people too. Like he did, but there's no, it, there's no comparison to Trump. But I do believe that if Trump was a quote unquote regular Republican and was doing all this stuff, people would be less engaged because, you know, he wouldn't just be so disgusting about it, right? He, I do think he, that the, yeah, the, he, the, the, the personality is a hook and that engages people in the politics. And I guess in the end, I guess that's what this election comes down to, right? I, I think there is, I think 90, I'm just pulling this number out of my, my arse, but I think 90% of the voting population is basically just going on cues what is blue, what is red, what's associated with this cultural signifier. What's, uh, so, and then to the extent that there's a jump ball here, it's just like, Joe Biden just seems nice. 
Right. And yeah. and, and right. Donald Trump seems like a jerk. Right. I'm just tired. Or, of or he him. seems yeah. or he seems so unhinged that I think there's some people that are being peeled off that are just like this. He's actually feeling dangerous in a way that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unhinged, yeah. relentless, in yeah. my face, t- making he's me worn think people about down. things more than right. I want to. I mean, yeah. that whole, it's basically coming down to like, uh, Trump is just too much yeah. of yeah. something. Shut and Joe up. Biden just seems Shut to be, you know, up. fine. Right, yeah. And exactly. I think that, and I think there's a chance if the pandemic hadn't happened, that wouldn't have been the case. It's, we got, we just have been so... We've just been confined to these screens and we've just had to watch Trump so much and Biden pulling away means that he represents peace and quiet in a way that Trump doesn't. And we crave it. <laughs> right. Right. I think that's true. I think also just from a uh, an operating standpoint, it's it's a different I mean, the you know, uh, there, there's a whole myriad of, of other things. But I think, yes, the I I. It scares me to have con- to con. I mean, it's I'm still scared of, of the election, anyways. But it I yeah. it, it it makes me very nervous to contemplate Joe Biden having been the nominee without uh, coronavirus because yeah. I'm not convinced you could defer so c- completely to the idea of this being a referendum on Donald Trump. Yes. In other mm-hmm. words, you would have to show up with something that. You know, beyond, I'm you. You wouldn't. You're not even gonna know I'm here. Uh, yeah. And 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 but um, you wouldn't you know. have the body count, and it and it's a body count that you didn't get from a war, which probably would have helped Trump somehow. Yeah, right. Like yeah. you, you just have what you can confront him with. No one can look away from. I, to be honest with you, I am a little bit surprised at this point that we have not bombed Iran. Uh, I mean, we still have two weeks left. And but I am. I would have thought by October 16th, if you had told me that Donald Trump was down by 10, Mm -hmm. that um, there would be more drastic measures being taken by him by now. I think we just saw one the other day where, you know, Rudy Giuliani somehow got a hold of a computer that somebody dropped off at a (laughs) computer repair store and came back for. But That's the I part mean, of the story that I'm, I'm sort of like, I haven't quite dug out. Like, <laughs> who's the guy who drops off the computer at a computer store? Like, you like, care enough right. about, like, I can understand, like, oh, I can't figure out how to get, you know, I can't find my mail. Well, I'm going right. to throw out the computer. Like, right. yeah, I can imagine, like, somebody doing that. Like, I, this computer's got such malware. I can, you know, like, my, my parents always say that. Like, it's like an 11-year-old's version of a John le Carré novel. Yeah. yeah. Like, right. But then, like, it's who crazy. goes and drops off their computer at a computer repair shop and then just, like, ah, ah, forget it. I don't right. need it. Yeah. I took all that time to take it down there, but I don't need it. They, I, I feel mean, like I kind of do do that sometimes. I have done that. Have you? I feel like there's been times when like there's something that I, like I remember having like a camera that I wanted to get fixed, but I didn't know really want the camera that much. I barely had the energy to take it in to get fixed. And it's kind of a way of getting rid of the things in your life that you feel used it as bummed. Storage, you used it as a storage yeah. facility, basically. The repair yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and trash but I couldn't quite bring myself to throw it away. Did you leave the film in it with the horrible compromising pictures of you? <laughs> oh, right. With you, you in, with Burisma people. Yeah. Maybe money. not that. But Sam, I think what you're talking about is like, he only really has one mode. And so they're just trying everything that worked in 2016. And I think it's probably driving. Trump they also ran out of time. They, yeah. And they also seemed like they just couldn't get it together in time. I mean, the yeah. coronavirus, him getting COVID was a curveball. And yeah. so who knows what they had planned otherwise for these. Yeah, that's true. Tweets. Good point. Well, guys, um, the, uh, the podcast sounds like a lot of fun. I think I'm going to go to predict it and try and make a ton of cash. Biden is trading at 65 cents on predict it right now, Sam. Do you think that's a fair price? Yeah. Okay. I was going to ask you that. I don't know what that means. Like, so what does that mean? Like, 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 as opposed to like a dollar 65 or as opposed so to every, dollar? so every position ranges from one cent to 99 cents. Okay. And you buy shares and if the, sh- and if it comes out, yes, you're paid out a dollar. So right now this means that the collect, according to the collective wisdom of predicted, there's a 65% chance that Biden will win the election because he's trading at, at 65 cents. But Trump at no is trading at 60 cents. Right. So it's there's even all, like, there's, sometimes there's a little arbitrage so it's even low, a, a it's, mismatch there. Yeah. Right. I mean, 
I, I, I would, I think at 65 cents, that seems like a fair price. I mean, I would be a little more interested at 60 cents with Biden, but I, you know, it's very hard. This is why like, I, I'm not good at these things because I can't, I cannot pull out my aspirations from my analysis in that regard or my fears, frankly. This is one of the big tensions of our podcast is whether we treat predict it as an investment strategy or a wishing well. Mm -hmm. And Starly over the course of this season has switched. She used to only bet with her heart and now Mm -hmm. she's become a complete (laughs) neolib capitalist robot who only cares about her portfolio and she spends all this time on like the electoral college margin of victory market yeah except i yeah except i still don't vote ever vote for trump winning i can't bring myself to do that right i mean that's part of the problem i was i was saying to 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 ben dixon earlier was just like you know we can look at the polls you can look at the polls even in the swing states where the electoral college is but what we cannot tell is how to factor in these voter registration numbers Mm-hmm. And we cannot, you know, because w- there is no doubt in my mind, the election is going to come down to uh, a similarly tiny group of people. We don't know how effective, like, look, Pennsylvania, there's a story today about 360,000 uh, absentee ballots that got confused. I mean, I can even make out, like, everybody seems to be completely befuddled by the whole thing. And you just don't know, like, Hillary Clinton lost by 40,000 votes. So when you're talking about right. 360,000 ballots that are going out, like, you know, the idea that the the election can rest upon things that are almost immeasurable at this point seems to me to be very likely. And, you know, with all due respect to predict it, how uh, you guys worship at the altar of a, <laughs> um, of a gambling platform. Use your words very carefully, Sam. We're very, very touchy about how people talk about predict it. <laughs> Uh, that that requires a an assumption that there is enough available information th- uh, th- that yeah. that people could even aggregate to make that assessment. And I don't think there is. I just don't think that we there are so many factors, particularly this time around. And maybe in general, when you're talking about races that are this close that there is enough information out there to, to make a genuine uh, rational assessment. And so I would are say, talking, yes. Are you talking about sense. known unknowns right now? Are you quoting Donald Rumsfeld? You're channeling Donald Rumsfeld, right? There's a lot of known unknowns. We do, there might even no, be some we unknown don't know. unknowns. We, we, unknown we, unknowns. We know the unknowns, but there are some unknowns we don't that are also unknown. Right, the unknown unknowns. I think there's gonna be literally people who don't take their ballots in. That was what I thought about the other day. Like I have my ballot in my house. I'll go drop it off. Don't you think there's going to be like a few, some people who are just too mean to vote and this number, the number of steps it's going to take this time. Uh, I can tell you this, that uh, my junior year of, uh, of college, I ran for student government president and John Benjamin, uh, one of my closest friends, well, probably my closest friend in my life forgot to vote for me and I lost by like five or six votes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So you didn't get that be a lesson for you. Supreme court college justices because of that loss. Mm -hmm. That's right. You weren't, I did not have the ability to influence the judiciary board that year. It was, uh, let me just say this, John, it was great to meet you. (laughs) John Kimball. I've heard so much about you and to have this opportunity to talk to you has been great. Uh, Starly, um, uh, great to meet you Me and, and David, wonderful to see you again. Folks can find um, election profit makers on, I imagine, just about any podcast platform. Yeah, absolutely. Sam. Yeah, they that's absolutely how it works, can. I think. Yeah. All right. Well, we put a, uh, a link to one of those platforms. Okay. Uh, Thank you. In, uh, at majority.fm. Thanks, that. guys. Really appreciate it. Great it was fun to see to you, talk Sam. To you Take care. Yeah. All right. Bye. All right, folks, going to head into the uh, fun half of the program, wherein uh, we will have fun. And I guess we will take your uh, phone calls. We, um, uh, Disco Stu says, considering Biden is up 10 in the national polls, can we really envision a scenario where that number was higher? This sounds crazy, but maybe he's running a decent campaign. I mean, I think... <laughs> I think 
he is running the best campaign that Joe Biden can run. Let's put it that way. And what is relevant, though, is the Electoral College at the end of the day. And what is relevant is, um, you know, where where he's running well. And, you know, it appears that he is. But we will we will see. Uh, we're going to take a break. We'll take some phone calls. Uh, I see our, our calls have filled up. And um, again, just a reminder, your support makes this show possible. Join the majority report dot com. Next week's going to be another crazy week. We'll be here five days uh, of, of next week. In addition to uh, covering the debate Thursday night. Um, I don't know what else to tell you, folks. Uh, don't forget, check out Nomi's show today at three. Um, check out uh, uh, Jamie's show, uh, The Antifada, patreon.com slash The Antifada. Matt, uh, TMBS this week. Yeah, uh, Sunday we'll have a think tank for patrons, so look forward to that. We're gonna, I'm going to talk about the uh, Mi'kmaq, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but Native Americans in Nova Scotia who are having some troubles with commercial fishermen uh, up there. It's really crazy stuff. They're literally destroying um, property uh, because indigenous people are fishing as allowed by you know the treaties and Canadian law. So we'll be talking about that on Sunday uh, for uh, patrons, patreon.com slash TMBS. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun half. RM for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun half. Are you ready? <laughs> what, who sent us this? <laughs> Alpha males are back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it in my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Almost says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back, back. I, I, I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Dinner to song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Dinner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks, fuck your mind up. I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck em. Almost says what? 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black. Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Okay. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are back, back. Africans are black. God and I am. Uh, do you think the Democratic Party as an institution is further to the right than it has been in your lifetime or at least static? 
does that not disprove the idea that the Democratic Party is open to influence by the left? They are certainly more corporate and militaristic than I've seen in my 20 years of being politically active and only adopt social issues when public. This is from Sam the Peacock. I, I got to tell you, I that is a, a comment that is like borderline bizarre to me. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that the party is more to the left today than it has been in almost 30 years. Um, Bill Clinton was incredibly corporatist. The idea of the idea of Joe Biden passing the 1994 crime bill today is just absurd. He just disavowed it. The idea of, of the, the like welfare reform passing today is absurd. The idea of, trying to cut social security like uh, Obama did 10 years ago is absurd. Um, the idea of, of everyone voting to support um, a, a, an invasion um, of Iraq today in the democratic party is absurd to me. Um, the, I, 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 there is n no doubt I say without even the slightest bit of hesitation. I'm not saying it's I'm not saying it's particularly left, but relatively speaking, this is the most left the party has been um in a, at least since the mid 90s and probably a little bit, you know. I, I, yeah. I mean, since certainly since Clinton, without a doubt. Um Hi. I don't think it's so even remotely me, close. Let me ask you this then. Do you think the Democratic Party is more left relative to the movements on the ground and the base of the Democratic Party? Is more left? No, right, like I think a, I think the left has the left is bigger and more left and stronger relative to the Democratic Party than it has been in the past, which is, I think, the dynamic you need. And that's probably why the Democratic Party has been moving to the left. I mean, that's the way it works, right? Is like the further out the the um, the further out the, the left is, the more it's pulling the party. Um, yeah. I'm just saying I can understand why people would be frustrated that it would take uh, the biggest uh, social uprising in American history to get Joe Biden to move one inch rhetorically on stuff like the crime bill. Yeah. Is it the biggest in history, though? I think it is the I biggest think it protest is. movement I, in U.S. history. I think history. it is. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it is. And but I think, you know, I, I think we'll get a sense of 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 what kind of reform we're going to see, you know, um, if he takes office and the Democrats, I mean, I think criminal justice reform, I think is actually one of the low hanging fruits, to be honest with you, uh, because I think you're going to see like people like Mike Lee and Rand Paul try and reestablish their bona fides and, and join up with Cory Booker, let's say, and they're going to do, I don't, it's, it's going to be insufficient, but it's going to be a bill to the left. I mean, I'm not saying that people shouldn't be frustrated, I'm answering the, the question that was asked of me. And um, I would say, without a doubt, the Democratic Party is to the left of where it's been uh, in, in, in my lifetime. I mean, it's just, it's just a fact. Uh, I also think people need to remove like it's static from their analysis of really anything. Like institutions aren't static. I don't know. I, I, I see that a lot. Like this is a static institution. Clearly it's not. Neither is uh, a Republican. Let's go to the phones. Calling from a 509 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Sam. Yes. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. How are you, Ronald Reagan? Well, I managed to get through the shadow ban, so feeling pretty good about myself. My shadow ban uh, of you. Yes. Yes. Um, I, so I'm shadow banned on your show. But I, um, I tried to call David. I tried to call David Pacman a cuck on his super chat the other day, and it wouldn't let me. Wow! So uh, first, first amendment um, violations all over the place. 
Well, now you know why you are a shadow band on this show. It's because you're going into the super chat of uh, David Pakman. That will get you an immediate shadow banning. <laughs> oh, God. I brought this upon myself, I think. No, no, without a doubt. Um, I, mean, I think that's pretty clear. Completely. Um, so I, I know you guys talk So-called about progressives this. Like are actually that. regressive. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I don't want to, uh, I know you talked about this the other day. I don't want to belabor the point, but I wanted to mention something about the, the Chomsky thing um, from the podcast, Bad Faith. Oh, I can't um, wait to talk so, even more about the Chomsky thing that happened on another podcast. Jamie sounds okay. like she's not excited to talk about it, but go ahead. Got to be quick. Okay. I'll call, I'll call Pacman about it. <laughs> well, I'm interested to hear what your point is. Uh, okay. Uh, well, just real quick. So, I mean, I think that um, if we strip down politics to like the the root right now in America, it comes down to that on the left, we sort of understand that like we should do things even if we don't necessarily benefit ourselves, and, and if there's other people who might materially benefit it's sort of like a an act of selflessness um and we believe in community and, and doing things even if it costs us personally um and and even if the people that are benefited are people that we don't know at all or, or don't personally care about whereas the the other side of the the political spectrum right now is literally the part the party of gordon gecko you know uh, greed is good and um, every man is an island unto themselves, and so on and so forth. And so I think, I, I guess, the thing that struck me as, as disappointing was hearing the argument that, um, you know, as leftists, we should only be uh, voting in our own self-interest. And I, I know it's frustrating to keep voting for a party that um, fails to live up to, you know, our hopes and dreams. Um, but right now, even if you look at it and don't see a material change in your own life uh, from the two uh, parties, uh, there are people who will be impacted. And I, I hope that the type of leftism we're promoting is one that says, I don't see what's in it for me, but um, there are other people that, that need me to stand up for them right now um even though you know all my, right well let's 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 decouple it from practice. let's decouple it from um from any other podcast just the the perspective i mean be uh, decoupling it from that but the the perspective being like there's no material benefit for me because uh i'm not getting um uh better health care or i'm not getting um, uh, you know, a loan forgiveness, or I'm not getting free university or free childcare or, uh, or, 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 you know, or something to that effect. Uh, I mean, is that, is that what you're talking about as opposed to like what? Right. Well, I guess, I guess that's, yeah, that's what I'd be. Mean. I mean, like, uh, they're, you know, obviously I, I keep bringing this up, so I'm sorry. <laughs> But, you know, even if the only thing on on the table were DACA, that was the only thing we could say, like, we should get out and vote for those people, um, even though, like, I don't fucking have DACA. I, <laughs> I, mean, I think there's two separate doesn't, issues. Doesn't, it doesn't affect my life. The issue is, like, are you talking to voters or are you talking to people um, talking about electoral strategy and if abstaining will send a message to the Democrats. Because frankly, like, yeah, you can, I agree with what you're saying, Reagan, that that's how we should approach voting. But in terms of uh, energizing disillusioned voters, I do think that ultimately it's not going to be anybody's argument. It's going to be the party actually delivering. I don't think arguments are going to fix that problem for the Democrats in absence of that. But, but like, I, when I say, like, I'm not voter shaming, it's because I'm criticizing the specific theory that abstinence is going to send the Democrats a message. Yeah. And the attitude towards these disaffected voters, I think, is what 
part of what Brie was railing against. And God, I feel like I talked about this way too much yesterday, but well, I, I don't want to like decouple it from I want to decouple it from the, I want to decouple it from the podcast because um, we don't, you know, one of the things that I think is very difficult to do is to really get a sense of, you know, exactly who these d- disaffected voters are why they're disaffected. I mean, I think there's a lot of assumptions that go into that, that we don't really have a lot of data on. Well, Um, we have some. And like Bree cited the 80,000 black Americans who voted in 2012 and didn't vote in 2016. Some of that was voter suppression. More of it was people saying, I don't believe that my vote is going to make a difference. And, you know, a lot of it was probably tied to in their own lives. So like, Brie and lots and lots of people, not just Brie, would bristle at the idea that it's up to us. It's up to the left to go in there and browbeat those people who are just trying to stay alive from day to day and say, OK, I know that. Uh, who is saying that the, the disaffected vote like I'm quite convinced Chomsky that said it's on the activists to convince those disaffected voters that they need to do exactly what Ray Gunn is saying. They need to do this for, you know, not necessarily for their own good, but for the good of the world, for climate change, uh, for DACA or whatever. And Bria is saying, um, OK, I think it's a little bit uh, obnoxious to expect me to go to my 68 year old aunt who makes $7 an hour at the grocery store and tell her you need to uh, take a day off from work, stand in line for hours and risk getting COVID to vote for someone who has said that he's not going to help you. Like she just wanted well, an I mean, acknowledgement of that. He has said the $15 minimum wage. Okay, well, that's probably a specific thing that dis. Uh, you know, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop now. You know what I meant. You know what she meant. Well, I'm sorry. The entire thing gets confused when you call it voter shaming. When another thing about abstaining from elections to send Democrats a message is coupled in there. That's why I think you need to distinguish between those two things. It's no, I critis- agree. Right, and like I think Chomsky is trying. There weren't voters in that. Uh, there weren't disillusioned voters in that conversation. He was talking to media people. Yeah, but Bree knows disillusioned voters, and it is like probably an overlapping group somewhat. But yeah, they were talking about two separate things. Like A, the idea that the left should uh, somehow leverage our votes as part of a negotiation process with the party to try to move them on certain things. And I just don't think that was ever going to work because they really, we have no leverage. Trump is the other guy. Like they're going to tell us to F off. But the other thing, just wanting an acknowledgement of the bad electoral strategy of trying to shame or browbeat disaffected people and underprivileged people into but, but, I mean, taking like, personal is, risks. Wait, wait, wait. But, but, but this, this whole like shaming, browbeating, like there's like, I don't think, I don't think that Chomps, I don't know. I didn't see Chomsky say this, but I certainly am not saying like, you should go and find people who are not voting and tell them that they're idiots and shame them. I'm shaming the people to the extent that I'm shaming anybody. It is people who are not disaffected voters there are people who are engaged in the political process and are pursuing a strategy that is stupid. Okay. Um, well, he, no, he did say, he did quick. say that yeah, it's on ahead. her right. as an I'm activist to convince that, those people. They don't go away. Uh, well, so I don't know. It's weird to me in some ways, like, cause some of these same people are, who are really sensitive about being shamed, whatever that means. Like if I, during the primary, if I ever said anything nice about like Elizabeth Warren on Twitter, I was called like a traitor or like all these things. I didn't, I didn't vote for her. Um, I voted for Bernie, but like, uh, you know, some of these people are, are happy to engage in uh, so-called vote shaming when, when they see the she was being on the other foot. Um, but I, maybe we can get off this and I'll put you on something different, which is something else I've been wondering about and I'll hang up which is like, when does the left do an autopsy on the Bernie campaign and like what went wrong? Because it seems to me that there was a, a theory of, of change and that if you, you put out a, a message that was popular enough that you would mobilize, you know, huge numbers of, of non-voters and it seemed to just- Not um, work. Not work. And I'm wondering if you think 
you know, maybe it works in a different election cycle or uh, it seems to me that the, the project of, of persuading people has a ways to go. But that's uh, that's what I wanted to ask you about. Yeah, I think Matt Carp's um, postmortem is probably the best that I've seen so far. But I think that's right, that the turnout, a whole bunch of people who don't vote before that that was a strategy that was always going to be super difficult to execute and it wasn't executed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I mean, I think there is something to the fact that if the Democratic Party wants to um, if anybody wants to to activate these people, you have to do it from a legislative perspective, like you actually have to deliver the goods. Now, with that said, there's also the problem like there's a lot of people who are on Medicaid, for instance, and I understand they don't um, that that it's not easy for everybody to vote. I think day one, one of the things that the, the Democrats, I hope, do is, you know, make voting a uh, establish a federal right to the extent that they're going to be able to get it through the Supreme Court. I don't know. Uh, but let's just for a moment, you know, pretend that the Supreme Court won't won't shut down some of these initiatives, but make it easier, like a federal holiday on on Election Day or something. But we do know that. Many, many people on Medicaid, for instance, don't vote. And, um, you know, when we look at like states that have expanded Medicaid by referendum, it's more often than not people who are not getting the Medicaid who are pushing it through. And even like Medicaid recipients um, aren't aren't necessarily voters. So I'm just looking at this. I'm not I'm not blaming anybody. I'm looking at this as a physics problem or a math problem. And so I think it's like there's it's it's far more complicated, I think, than delivering, you know, um, material benefits in terms of an electoral strategy or promising to deliver material benefits as an electoral strategy. Um, I think what what passing stuff legislatively does is it really protects those measures it doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily um, accrue to the party unless, you know, I mean, you know, the, the New Deal was something that did accrue, I think, to Democrats for an extended period of time. But I don't know if we we have, you know, that's a that's a fair I, I don't know that we could pass anything that extensive uh, in this era, but maybe. Well, we don't have the class power. We do not have the institutional power. Right. We don't have the level of unrest on the ground. Right. And so, I mean, I think, yeah, that that autopsy is pretty important. I mean, I also think that, to be honest with you, I think it's quite possible that if Bernie Sanders, um, if you put um, Bernie Sanders in, um, you know, if, if, if you put Bernie Sanders, you know, 20 years earlier, uh, or even 10 years earlier, the, the, the outcome may have been different. Um, I mean, look, we actually don't know what the outcome would have been uh, for Bernie running a general election campaign on these uh, class-wide demands and, you know, particular well, demands Well, we're talking about well. the primary, though. Right. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, my caucus, my DSA caucus, Emerge, actually published an article doing a bit of a postmortem of the Bernie campaign. And... Um, yeah, it's true. Like, I think some people were a little overly optimistic thinking there would be a one to one correspondence between running on material benefits for people and getting everybody to vote for you because. Well, but uh, the real issue is the specific one is can you get voters who don't usually vote by dangling material benefits? And that did not work. Yeah, no, a lot of people. A lot of people don't vote and a lot of people never will. Um, and that no, those numbers are higher for uh, the working class and for the poor. The single biggest indicator of whether or not someone is going to vote is their socioeconomic status. So, yeah, I think that speaks to the need for uh, other centers of power outside of electoral campaigns, uh, because people need to have solidaristic experiences in order to believe that this kind of solidarity is possible, right? Yeah, and I mean, I think, that's, I think that's true. And not everybody engages uh, primarily with electoral politics, because people, you know, they've heard it all before, even a very strong platform sounds like stuff they've heard before and was never delivered. So I, I think there's really, there are really no shortcuts to creating the kind of, uh, institutional power. I'm talking about 
militant uh, labor unions. I'm talking about uh, tenants unions. I'm talking about uh, alternative media sources, all these different things that will get people more engaged. And hopefully these benefits will bubble up into the electoral sphere. But trying to start with an electoral campaign is kind of like the tail wagging the dog. Right. But I mean, we do we we, we, we do need to acknowledge that there was a total miscalculation as to wh what offering these material benefits would do in terms of incentivizing people to vote, right? And none of that materialized. In the primary, we don't know. It could be very well, yes, I know, but we also don't know if Amy Klobuchar could have gotten into the primary and could have just mopped up everything, I mean, into the general election. We don't know that either. I mean, yeah, I mean, that is the depressing part of what Bree what we do know is what happened in the primary like in the Democratic possible, primary. It's possible that uh, Biden's strategy, you know, of appealing to these suburban moderates is more of a winning strategy than Bernie's strategy of offering people material benefits. We don't actually know. And for the left, uh, well, we know we know it worked in the primary. We know what we, we do have the test in the primary to test those two propositions. Well, there were a lot of other things scrambling it too, don't you think? It ended. There, there's very always there's always Bernie's, other Bernie's there's always campaigning. other things. We have a global pandemic. Like it's not just a little something. That I think happens. the race, honestly, I think the race was over before the pandemic. You could be right, but like a general again is very very different from a primary, and we just don't know. But what I was saying was, it is possible that Biden's uh, strategy is more winning in a general election campaign than Bernie's. And I think that's a bitter pill for the DSA for Bernie types to swallow because it shows that we have a whole lot of work to do before we can contest an election on that level and win. Can I just make a, let's go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I'm saying it doesn't mean that we should give up necessarily, but um, I think there are lots of other things we can do, uh, including, you know, elections at the local level, including all the institutional factors that I just said before we can run a successful uh, presidential campaign. Uh, yeah, I would just say two quick things for Reagan. One, I think uh, one postmortem I would do is we spent too much time on the war and PMCs and not enough on the never Trumper types who actually decided the primary. And also, Warren should have uh, endorsed Bernie and maybe something could have turned out differently there. But yes, anyway. I mean, I think, frankly, they both both candidates, um, you know, were were bad in that regard. They both, yes, and I think the whole uh, Warren PMC thing was a horrible, horrible miscalculation by the left, frankly. But, um, but we got Joe Biden. Uh, meanwhile, Donald Trump is out there, and this story, you know, we 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 covered um, as it was going. You, you'll recall that out in uh, Portland, a um, right wing protester was was allegedly killed by, or I should say was killed, allegedly by this man, Michael Reinhold. Reinhold was a, um, I guess, uh, uh, maybe a self-professor, at least uh, was protesting with uh, anti-fascists against uh, right-wingers and, and uh, killed, allegedly, a right-wing protester. And... He was, well, I want to say apprehended by local authorities who had been apparently in some form or another deputized by federal marshals. The federal marshals were also involved in, uh, in, a, in supposedly attempting to apprehend Michael Reinal. The reason why I say supposedly is because the New York Times came out with a story a couple of days ago saying that all of the witnesses to this supposed attempt at apprehension said that the um, these federal marshals or these deputized federal marshals came out of unmarked cars, guns a blazing, and shot Michael Reinald dead before the guy even had an opportunity to know what was going on. Here's Donald Trump reiterating his claim that he had ordered retribution on this guy, and that's what he got. But the Democrats smear decent Americans as racist, slander our nation as evil, indoctrinate our children and incite anti-American riots on our streets that we could control in 25 minutes as we did in Minneapolis. 
as we do wherever we go, but they have to invite us in. By law, they have to invite us in. We want to go to Portland so bad. That one would take 15 minutes to set. 15 minutes. And the man that shot another innocent man, this was an innocent man shot, killed, instantly killed. I said, what happened? Well, we haven't arrested him. Two days, three days went by. We sent in the U.S. Marshals. Took 15 minutes, it was over. 15 minutes, it was over. We got him. They knew who he was. They didn't want to arrest him. And 15 minutes, that ended. Anyway, but, and they called themselves peaceful protesters. 15 minutes, that's all it took to execute this guy. I mean, um, at one point, I hope we have a Department of Justice that looks into this. We should not be having federal marshals functioning as basically death squads. I mean, I, I, I don't know why we need to actually articulate those words. It should be self-evident. But we literally have a president bragging about it on television. And then a bunch of pe- people cheering uh, at the idea. I mean, <laughs> like, you know, like I remember the, the debate during uh, the Obama years. Um, about the concept of going in and assassinating Osama bin Laden. I was of the mind that we should have attempted to arrest him, capture him, I guess, as a uh, prisoner of war, and put him on trial. And um, there was a little bit of controversy about the idea that we shouldn't have assassinated him. Uh, there were not many voices who who expressed that. I was, um, you know one of the the, the 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 sort of the people in the distinct minority but the idea that the president of the united states is actually out there bragging about doing this to an american to 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 like uh, i mean to not the person who was considered the greatest evil in the history of the country essentially is osama bin laden um uh was who was a suspect in a murder investigation was summarily executed by federal marshals i mean this is um pretty scary stuff well one definition of fascism that i've seen floating around is when a country an imperial power brings its uh colonial war tactics home and uses them on its own citizens usually amid a crisis so i think that fits pretty well yeah what's crazy about trump is like all these conversations i remember during the obama administration like the alaki's kid assassination um People, you know, on our side of the aisle would be like, you know, this might come back to actually hurt us if we get the wrong guy in charge. And everyone's like, no, that's not going to happen. And then the very next president immediately um, sort of proves all those examples. Well, the weird thing, too, I mean, well, I mean, the only thing I would say is that, like, there's not a uh, I mean, you know, we had a uh, we did an interview with um, about that, those, you know, basically sending cops. Uh, out for an imperial project. I can't remember what the book is now. And people learn techniques fighting communists, you know, communists in in places like the Philippines and brought them back to U.S. policing. But there's no, there is no, um, this isn't a scenario where you have some type of legal legal framework for it. I mean, that's one of the things that I found most reprehensible about the Obama administration was that they created legal frameworks for, for this type of stuff, like in the assassination of al Waki and, and his son, for that matter, <clears throat> um, was the creation of legal frameworks for it. But there was no, I mean, the idea that, that Trump is out there and bragging about an extrajudicial killing, and that's just like story number seven of the day. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, have to create a how messed up is it. our society that that is uh, the case? I mean, honestly, it's like and cheered for and cheered for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these create... people miss, they miss their Iraq war songs. Yeah, they'll create a legal framework after the fact if they have to. But there's no indication right now that they're going to be. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, I mean, this goes down and there's. <laughs> And it's literally, it's like, you know, go to Google News and and just see, like, I don't even know if this made it into Google, you know, the the front page of Google News, which like you can scroll endlessly. President bragging about an assassination, essentially, of a, um, a, a murder suspect. 
I mean, put away every aspect of this. This is not a guy, this is not, this is like, I don't know, bragging about it. Really sort of stunning. It's Meanwhile, campaign material. What's that? If this is red it's meat. campaign material, yeah. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, speaking of the campaign, this is, um, well, this is, uh, I, you got a feel for uh, Laura Ingram here. And um, Steve Cortez. Who is Steve Cortez? Some, just some Fox News uh, correspondent. He's like, no, he's like a, uh, a Trump campaign outreach person for basically just Cubans in Florida. All right, guys, I want you to contemplate in your head. What is what would be the devastating thing, the knockout punch to Joe Biden if you are the the uh, the Trump um, campaign? Now, the problem they had is that they relied on Sleepy Joe and they basically set the the bar for Joe, um, Joe Biden so low. Like they're like, he's not going to be able to show up at the debate. Frankly, I you know, I was a little concerned about it, too. But that's a very risky strategy, because when the guy shows up. And can actually like, it's not like Donald Trump is, you know, uh, one of the world's greatest sort of, well, most sophisticated orators. Let's put it that way. Uh, Joe Biden shows up. You've lost your entire narrative. So maybe they're settling on this one. Can you believe it? Joe Biden as a ne nefarious children's television program hero. Well, as much, but he was pretty softball and the way he approached uh, Biden. Oh. It was very gentle, gentle reframing of some of his answers. Right. Uh, but listen. Savannah Guthrie was really a competitor to the president, not a moderator. Yeah, to say the least, you know, ABC put on uh, the equivalent of an of a church ice cream social for Joe Biden up in Philadelphia uh, as a as a TV program. It reminded me of Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. And conversely, NBC oh. staged a political knife fight down in Miami. And if I compare that to a TV program, it seemed more like The Wire. Uh, so I think what we saw today really, unfortunately, was a, a brazen display of media duplicity. Uh, it is extremely clear who corporate media wants. Now, the funny part is, who was it, Matt, that tweeted out like Joe Biden came off like Mr. Rogers? Oh, I don't know who exactly that was. Who was that? Was Mercedes Brandon? Slap. Mercedes Slap. I mean, oh, right. that is. And who is she again? Matt Slap's wife. Oh, right. OK, so the, exactly. So the 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 head of CPAC's wife and <laughs> Mr. Rogers. I mean, think about this, right? Joe Biden is winning with younger people. He's winning with older people. I went to go see that Mr. Rogers movie and in that theater was basically filled with people my age crying hysterically. <laughs> <laughs> basically, and it's like that is the worst cohort you want to say he is Mr. Rogers because that like we were all raised. We only had four channels on TV. That was it. And like Mr. Rogers was like our surrogate parents. This guy like uh, th the idea of comparing Joe Biden to Mr. Rogers and thinking that's a winning strategy. And they've got the, like, and the idea of like going on Fox news and comparing something to the wire. Nobody knows on Fox news, <laughs> like <laughs> who well, the Fox news audience watched the wire. I right. Mean, I mean, they are just so, they're so knocked out of the box. Now, if I, you did watch the wire, let's just say whose neighborhood would you rather be a character in? Mr. I, Rogers or, uh, you know, right. Exactly. Amsterdam. If I were, uh, if a, uh, Trump Spock's on Fox news, I would say that Trump was like a sitting duck on duck dynasty. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> can, can I just yeah, say exactly. like, if you had a computer that could simulate general elections and you could just plug in any figure from history against Trump, it's hard to think of one who would perform better in this election than Mr. Rogers. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We need to, do, we need to, do, to, um, to, well, I mean, certainly in terms of demeanor, right? I mean, the, the big question, well, there's, there's, you know, there, there's two or three sort of like 30,000 foot questions about this election. One is, is it possible to beat Donald Trump period? Like is, is it possible for any, Buddy running against Donald Trump to beat Donald Trump uh, because the his um, 
nationalism, racism, fascism is activating uh, more voters and they've been able to bring out more uh, sort of, you know, uh, it, it, it may just from the data, uh, non-college educated white voters. Is that possible? And then if it's possible, the question is, can you just, can you win by making it exclusively a referendum on Donald Trump? And that is a very binary question, because if you're going to come in and offer anything that is in any way going to be sort of um, And in the middle, Biden is the one who's just like, I'm not here. I am just like something that is not distasteful to as many people as possible. And you got to vote on whether you want to deal with Donald Trump anymore. That is basically what this election comes down to. And and we will we will see. But Mr. Rogers is certainly the guy you would want if you wanted to make it just exclusively a referendum on Donald Trump. Absolutely. I mean, to answer your question about what's going to bring out voters, um, I do know that turnout in midterms, as we've discussed, was driven by concern about Trump and concern about health care. So it's not the craziest idea to think that a candidate who combines both of those things would be more successful. Right. And, and, and but as it's articulated, you know, that's sort of what Biden's been running on. It's certainly what all the uh, Democrats are running on is, you know, they're not necessarily offering a um, a health care plan that I would want, but they are aided by the fact that the Trump administration is attacking health care that exists now. That's why health care, it's not even about health care anymore, right? It's all about pre-existing conditions. That's the big surrogate. And, and that is a- For a lot of people, it's also about being able to afford your premiums. Well, I understand, but I'm talking about in the context of the election, you know, the the you don't hear. I mean, it's Joe Biden's not offering anything that's going to reduce pro, uh, premiums. I, if he, I mean, if he has a plan, it's it's a rather technocratic one. And it's not, you know, a bumper sticker. The the bumper sticker is pre-existing conditions. And um, I think, like I say, I think the Democrats are lucky there's not another month or so because the Republicans are starting to sort of mount a defense to that. I don't think it's a, it's a disingenuous one, but it's, it's, a, it's at least a response. Um, here is, this is from, uh, <clears throat> it's from today. Rudy Giuliani, and look, uh, my daughter um, causes me a lot of grief on a lot of things. So I can certainly uh, appreciate Rudy Giuliani's feeling that his daughter has basically said, my, my dad is horrible. Don't vote, uh, for, <laughs> to vote for Joe Biden. So Rudy's having a tough uh, day. And there's reports that came out that the White House was specifically warned by intelligence agencies that there were people who were trying to feed Giuliani false information about Hunter Biden. So he may be feeling a little pressure about that. Here he is uh, talking about Hunter Biden's emails on Fox and Friends and talking about Hunter Biden's drug use and sex life. Um, remember, Rudy Giuliani placed the control center for New York City in World Trade Center number seven, as opposed to in Brooklyn, as uh, recommended by his police chief at the time, because he wanted to maintain a side relationship with a woman who was not his wife at the time. And it was easier to hook up. It was a it was like a what uh, like a love shack. It didn't work out so well. But here's Rudy Giuliani. China has plus a lot more. They reveal federal crimes, they reveal disgusting sexual behavior, and then they re reveal sexual behavior, and then they reveal disgusting sexual numerous behavior. times where no. he has totally gone on crack, which yeah. means he spent most of the last five years on crack, and who would... That's, that's, that's Rudy Giuliani going on and on about the crack. Three more? Taking drugs while he's in rehab. 
and he puts him in business with four of the most crooked people in the world. Well, now that's got to be stupidity or greed. Mr. Mayor, you've made, you know, you, you brought up a lot of allegations. We look forward to uh, looking into them some more. Oh, we, no, no, no. They're uh, all in emails. Look at them. No, I, I, I understand. Maybe no. we'll come over to your office. We'll all be socially distanced. And from you send somebody over and they can they can go through the whole thing. And if there's one or two things I can release, I'll give it okay. to him. All right. Rudy. I got to call my source. I, he's pretty he's been pretty easy on it so far. All right. Good enough. Rudy, thank you very much for joining <laughs> us live. Thanks, Rudy. Thank you. So he's got all the emails that are going to blow the lid off this whole question as to whether Hunter Biden was a crackhead for a couple of years and he'll release them. He's got to check with his source first. Like, yeah, hey, maybe, maybe you might want to do that before you go on television and then, then talk about these things. Yeah, I would check with my source, see if I can release them. I don't know. I guess it's tough to get him on the phone. I mean, the, um, there's so many holes to the story uh, in terms of the emails, but even if they were all true, nobody cares. Yes. It just yes. seems mean. Like, Optically, how, yeah. How many people in this country have a family member or close friend who struggled with addiction? Or lost somebody, you know, to like a uh, an opioid addiction. And I mean, like, that's what Donald like Trump everything. ran on the first time. And, and the idea that that's going to, and, and, uh, you know, sort of make a, a difference in this instance is fascinating. I mean, the, the, the only thing that they have to run on now is the fact that Twitter wouldn't let people share the links. And frankly, I think, you know, I, I mean, I think they have a point. I don't think Twitter should be in that business. I think what we need to do is because they I, I'm not going to leave it up to Twitter to be sort of a random uh, policers of that. I think what we need to do is institute a, you know, Section 203, scratch that thing and, and, and make all of these social media platforms a lot smaller so that they can have actual people making assessments about these on a daily basis as opposed to some type of algorithm. But yeah. That, that is one point I brought up yesterday, right? Like, it's kind of biting the right-wingers in the ass right now because they are the ones who wanted the social media companies to be more powerful than the state and control the flow of information in this country. And guess what? Now they're doing it. Yeah, exactly. You got, it's just a marketplace of ideas. It's just, you know, it's like, um, I mean, that's the thing is that, the, they don't understand. I mean, I think like there are times where um, I think maybe Tim Poole, I'm not even sure, uh, or others have said like, we need government regulation over these entities. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, uh, on some level we do. I don't, I wouldn't want the government to take them over. I would want them all to be um, diminished in their, in their size um, so that we don't have a, a first amendment issues. It's just that there's not one that becomes so, important that it's a utility i'd be fine with having a government take them over but not this government well the problem is if you're going to do that you don't always get to choose which government it is four well, years later i mean a different kind of government a very different kind of government that does different things for different reasons not the one that we have now democrat or republican you're still having people make a decision, right? In that entity, like, right? I mean, like, you're still having, having, and it's, it, you know, every now and then you get a bad apple, I guess. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is I would be fine with exerting more democratic control over these companies. Yeah, and I, but I think the way to do that is, is to make them smaller. Because then you are, you, you are the, the you know, like, control and power is a relationship, right? It's always a dynamic. And it doesn't matter if I can lift a hundred pounds, you know, like 300 pounds on a bench press. It matters, you know, if you and I are in a, uh, like a, a physical struggle, but it doesn't if I'm, you know, with uh, Brandon Sutton, <laughs> right? Like power is a dynamic. It is not something that is inherent in an in individual. It is, in a, it is always in a relationship. And if you make these companies smaller and less uh, and, and the, the body politic is less reliant on them, they are necessarily more subject to democratic control. I feel like we could take Brandon Sutton, but only like all of us put together. Yeah, exactly. Um, Chris Christie. Oh, my God. 
How many times is this guy going to take it on the chin for Donald Trump? This probably is the last time. Here's he took Chris it in Christie. the lungs for him. Huh? He took it in the lungs for him. That's right. Here's Chris Christie doing a mea culpa. Uh, he was in the ICU for like seven days. Let's hear this. I heard the president say last night that he has no problem with masks. I think we should be even more affirmative about it. Um, that's why I put out the statement I did. We need to be telling people that there is no downside to you wearing masks. And in fact, there can be a great deal of upside. And I think if we all do that, that's one of the things we can contribute as Americans. And I think we need to be honest with the American people. Well, there's Chris Christie finally seeing the light. You know, you do get the sense that there's a little bit of scurrying on the on the decks where the rats are starting to get a little bit worried. Folks, I'm not going to have time for any more calls. I apologize. People have been hanging on for ages. We'll take one call. This guy, this person has been on for 105 minutes. Call from a 917 area code. You are the last caller of the day. Apologies, folks. Who's this? Is it me? Yeah. Oh, hello. My name is uh, Alex. I'm from New York. Uh, I wanted... I love the show wanted to call in about two things okay one i happen to work for a news organization that we're not big fans of and this news organization was saying in february march april even may that is a hoax maybe or not that serious while inside the building we had signs going up of don't of wash your hands constantly uh hand sanitizers going up in front of every entrance to every floor in front of the elevators just total disconnect of what was happening in the building versus what we were broadcasting huh. interesting that would have been a nice thing for you to send some pictures of from a an email address that's I, not traceable that would be outside i didn't know what the, what the email is I just majority, found out what the phone number was a couple of days ago. Majority reporters at gmail.com. Always okay. open well, to you, sir. Be safe. Uh, second thing is I've been hearing a lot about socialism and communism and fascism and all these isms. And go living in Manhattan and going to private pub, uh, not public, private schools my whole life. We heard a lot about why fascism is bad and imperialism is bad and why communism, socialism might be actually pretty good. Uh, I was not well, a school What private guy. schools are you going like to? School. I <laughs> Very progressive private schools in lower Manhattan. Okay. Where rich people send their kids to learn about how social, how to be socially liberal while, of course, we're not going to give away our money. Right. Those places. That doesn't sound so, very socialist to me. I know. Um, so my question is, can I have an actual definition of what socialism is or and communism? And I, I mean, my understanding is like every time they say something is socialist, it's like, well, it's free health care. It sounds good. But also, <laughs> why is uh, all of South America seem to be socialist are they not i guess they're not it seems authoritarian what's that is well, capitalism is that an economic structure is it a, i don't know what these words really uh, mean anymore yeah I you're really definition. can i can i make a simple uh i would just say a uh, simple distinction between socialism is ca and capitalism is who is determining economic priorities is it in by some method democratically controlled or is an owner deciding it and I mean, with regards to South America, I don't know. That might have to be a different call with regards to yeah, authoritarianism. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it's I would just, it's say the definitions that, of these words. That are, well, I would yeah. say that Matt's definition is a pretty good one. I mean, there are a, a lot of disagreements between different people who call themselves socialists on what socialism actually means. Um, and, you know, it's really easy to get in the weeds with it. But yeah, I think. Uh, Basically, we have socialism when the workers, the people who make the stuff, are the ones in control of the 
stuff making, right, of the economy, and they make sure. decisions. Um, I'd say the difference between socialism and communism, according to most people who believe and talk about this stuff, right? I mean, I just did an episode mm -hmm. of the Antifada and left communism, and they had a different view on it. I'll be sure Maybe to that's to it. Oh, great. Uh, but I think the main difference between socialism and communism is um, we no longer have uh, commodities, right? People aren't working for wages so they can then buy things on the market, right? We're purely producing things for their use value to humanity, and they are distributed, um, you know, Everyone works and gets things from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. That is the communist horizon, and that is the goal that I believe is worth fighting for. That's a great definition. But I, I understand that. I, I think that not everyone wants that. Even if there was a, a utopia, there will be jerks, for lack of not cursing, in that utopia. That is, that is my, want, no, that is my, true. that yeah, is Yeah, but my, there doesn't, there doesn't need is, to be bosses standing between you and healthcare though. Like that, well, right. But I, but, I, but that is my, that is my critique of, of, of communism in that regard is that like, I do think that it's that, that for me, um, I mean, uh, I think that everything is on a, um, a spectrum and, um, yeah. that I think that w our economic system is far too capitalist, um, at, at this moment. I, you there's know, a, like, there's I, a good thing too. What is capitalism? I always thought capitalism was the barter system. I have chickens. That's trade. Pigs. I'm going to give you five chickens for that pig. No, instead of no, well, yeah, it's not that, trade. That actually, stuff, we have currency. I that know. actually did arise concurrently with money. Before money, there wasn't uh, bartering and trade the way people like to pretend. Yeah, I mean, what you're talking about is 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 trade. I mean, and um, and that's sorry to bring this up right at the end. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> honestly, that, that... I'd recommend Eric Hobbs Bond, the Age of series, if you want to know what capitalism is historically, uh, but because it's a okay. it, it's. It's ownership and yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a really big topic, but it's, yeah, it's not markets and it's yeah. not trade. It's, it's a, that's it's wrong. A, it's okay. an entire mode of production that arose out of historically specific circumstances, and I think it's very important to study that history because it helps to denaturalize it and show, hey, this thing hasn't al always existed. It arose from specific yeah. circumstances in history as well as contingencies, right? And it can probably uh, it can probably end. We could probably do away with it through other circumstances and other contingencies. But I do think it's important to understand what capitalism is if you're going to be against it. Um, also, I, I think just want that's very true. And I think I mean I don't know. This is my thing, but I think a lot of people might also just think it's just the barter system. And if you go, no, it's not. It's something else. The barter system is fair. This is not, and this is why. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, the barter system is your. I mean, putting aside the, uh, I think, like the, um, the notion that barter really was born out of the existence of currencies. The barter system uh, does not allow you to accrue well i guess on some level it does right like you'll have like i've got 50 chickens now as opposed to right. anything else um but i mean that is uh, it, it's it's not just the barter system yeah, it, and know. it is okay. um well, you know but that's a good stepping point of like yeah. because when I, I think a lot of people when you say capitalism is bad you go well look at what capitalism is built it's built the world We've got or imperialism, yeah. colonization is bad. It's like, well, mixing of cultures is not bad. I don't. But think. that, yeah, but the, but you're but you're taking all the, like the you're taking all the mythological definitions, frankly, as read, and like not everybody does that. And I think, like, I I frankly think you can get through to people with the reality of it. Um, yeah. Like I, I I don't think these uh, preconceptions that you're identifying are so ingrained and. Well, frankly, he's so coming. Bad. Also, I you got to remember from where he's coming. Uh, and and what, what where where he's you know going into work every day. 
Yeah. And look, I appreciate the call. Good things about and, capitalism and send, too. Like, send us, I, I work there because I want to be a filmmaker, and I got a great gig. I understand, <laughs> but my point is, send some pictures. <laughs> send pictures. Majority yeah. Reporters at gmail.com. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the call. All if right. you want to hear me talk about communism at length, you're going to have to listen to the Antifada. Indeed. Uh, Scooney. Hey, guys, have you heard about Bruce Orr? Finally, right? Jonathan Armstead. Sam, you're right. Too many people cast protest votes as a form of artistic expression. I don't know if you saw the news today, but Larry Hogan has announced that he voted for Ronald Reagan in 2020. Uh, Malcolm X was right. A man who stands for nothing will fall for anything. He's just expressing his you know, desires and true self and through that vote. So good job, Hogan. Quinn from Indianapolis. Sam, I see you. Uh, see if you can get Tim Heidecker on next Friday. <laughs> Stand up special coming out and needs all the help he can get since his office hour show is so lame. Yeah, maybe yeah, I'll help he, him. Maybe if he comes begging to us. Yeah. I mean, maybe if I get a public apology from Tim Heidecker on the way that he uh, treated me, I came onto his show in good faith I took the time to go out and frankly, it was rude. And so I will contemplate having Tim Heidecker on this program if he apologizes to me, just simply because I'm a bigger person than he is. Not literally, because I think he's a little bit hefty, but I'm talking about just uh, in terms of integrity and in terms of heart. And you can clip this so that Tim Heidecker can see it. Well, uh, I also just wanted to say real quick, um, Dick Town that David Reese is in is very funny show. Oh, okay, there you go. Crass rebuttal. Senator Whitehouse saw the progressive movement in state win big, so I think he sees the writing on the wall. I mean, I, uh, I I think his perspective on a lot of this stuff has been has always been this, but he's just sort of you know narrow in some stuff. Uh, Mars on from Chicago didn't Feinstein participate in coronavirus related insider trading with her husband prior to the public knowing about the severity of the pandemic? She did in some respects. I think she was. I, I don't know how that resolved, but there was accusations. Let's put it that way. Um, Mo, she can hug Graham, but will she tell children who are concerned about climate change to shut up? Indeed. I became a member last week. Happy to support it. Thank you. Let me give you one of these. The CBD does not have THC. Uh, Unix Joker, Feinstein's husband today implicated in the college admissions scandal. She's on her way out, I think. Oh, excellent. Nancy Cadet, my husband ordered from Sunset Lake using MR discount and so far so good dealing with arthritis. All right. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Zach from Florida, can Chuck Schumer even fix what Feinstein did at the hearing? Uh, what do you mean she planned it? I don't know what you mean by that. Serious Sam, the vote held within the Senate Judiciary Committee to schedule the floor vote was in violation of committee rules as it requires two members of the minority present to be a uh, party to be present. Durbin was the only Democrat present while there was noted unprecedented holding of the vote out of committee before the hearings were even complete while witnesses were still being heard. Jeez. Uh, Cheney from Florida, Biden made 18 concessions to Bernie Sanders campaign. Uh, Sam, you should look into permaculture and agroforestry, sustainable farming that uses land consciously in favor of environmentalism and overall healthier plants. My sister, but why did Feinstein do that? Cognitive impairment or is she just dumb? Get the chuck out and take her with him. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Sandino, having grown up in Nicaragua, death squads and extrajudicial murders is nothing new. However, it's surreal hearing about this new reality stateside. Um, yeah, Orlando Letelier used to be the previous example and that was uh, not from, not our own you know, law enforcement. <laughs> All right, three more. Cocaine Mitch, TPP, Sammy. Did I call it PPP? Um, just received uh, Angry Boney. It just received uh, MR Carpentry Pencils and Masks. Now I'm wearing a mask and floundering as I try to decide which pencil to use first. And the final IM of the week. Cloward and Pivens Bro. L.A. resident just called Center of Feinstein's office. Finally got through to a staffer. Good for you, Matt, Brendan, Jamie. Good job this week. Thanks, guys. See you on Monday. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there.